Hello, welcome to JavaScript Essentials. In this course, you will learn how to become a front-end JavaScript developer. You should already have some understanding of HTML and CSS, but if you don't, that's okay because it's not technically required. This course was designed to help you break into web development as a career. So you'll be learning transferable programming skills such as try, catch, functions, classes, and inheritance, but you'll also be learning all of the JavaScript basics as well. You can take the skills from this course and apply them to other languages in the future, such as Node.js, Python, and PHP. Plus, you'll learn about the strange bits in JavaScript too, including hoisting, scopes, and closure. And while you're going through the lessons, there are two small projects that will give you working experience with real JavaScript code. This way, you don't enter the market blindfolded and empty-handed. The lessons come with downloadable code examples and lesson assignments so that you can get hands-on experience with, again, real JavaScript code. As a bonus, you'll also learn some ES6 as well. Nearing the end of this course, we will talk about five ways that you can make money while learning to code as a junior or intermediate developer with very little skill and how you can break into the web development industry. I'll also be providing you with some direction in regards to what you should learn after this JavaScript Essentials course. Some people say you should learn ES6, React, Node, jQuery, Angular, Python, PHP, Ruby, etc, etc, and that's just way too much, so I'm going to provide a little bit of clarity for you. Now in this course, there is no magic fluff, and in fact, I'm going to be sharing some of the secrets to becoming a successful web developer that no other teacher wants to admit. I've never heard another teacher admit anything like what I'm going to tell you in this course. And in fact, the first secret is that web development is actually more than just writing code. Hi, I'm Caleb, your JavaScript Essentials teacher. I'm a full stack web developer, I'm an online instructor, I'm an entrepreneur, and I've taught tens of thousands of students in just the last few years, and I've been coding since 1999. And now I'm passing my JavaScript knowledge on to you. Now, here are just a few things that students tend to appreciate about me. My direct way of teaching, again, no fluff. How I can break down difficult concepts into simple and easy to learn pieces, and how fast I answer questions that they have. Now I believe that online learning is more than watching videos. You need to learn the coding theory, absolutely. You need to jog your memory, and you need to practice writing code so again, you get hands-on coding experience. Once you finish this course, you'll get a certificate of completion to prove that you've learned the JavaScript essentials. So here's what's included in this course. Full, lifetime, 24-7 access to all of the HD videos, a certificate of completion, access to our support group, downloadable code examples, coding projects, and a final exam. And a 30-day money-back guarantee. Meaning, if you don't learn anything from this course in the first month, go and hit refund, get your money back. So what do you say? Are you ready to become a JavaScript developer? If you are, then click the enroll button. Hey everybody, welcome back. Before we begin, what I really want to talk about is what you can expect in this course. There are some courses where it's just video courses uh, and it's a teacher talking at you. And I've made those courses before and those are no longer acceptable. Uh, so I want to just sort of set the expectations for what this course is and what you're going to be able to get out of it. So the first thing you can expect from this course is code examples, right? Everything that I am going to be writing, whether it's in Sublime or right in the browser, I'm going to give you these code examples. So what you can expect, code examples. The second thing you can expect is, I don't want to call it homework, but they are sort of assignments. It's a way to practice everything that you will be learning. So we're going to go through 10, 15, 20 quick little courses, and you're not going to actually do a lot of homework in those, but at the end of that module or at the end of a series of videos, we are going to have a little assignment. The assignments are not going to be difficult. They're not going to hurt your brain. They're not going to stress you out. They are purely designed to practice what you have been watching in the videos. and feel free to always go back and use any sort of interactive code examples again. So number two, what you can expect, assignments. The third and last thing that you can expect from this course is access to our Facebook group. 
and this is a Facebook group of developers. It's been up for a couple of weeks already, uh, and there's over 500 developers. Uh, perhaps by the time you're watching this, there will be thousands of developers in this group, but it's just a simple Facebook group where people can go and ask questions. So whether you're watching this on any platform, you can come and join our Facebook group and ask your questions in there. We're happy to answer them. We're happy to give you support. Uh, there are, again, hundreds, possibly thousands of developers that are willing to help you out at any given time. There's no additional marketing. You don't need to sign up. You don't need to give your email or anything like that. It's just a great place to go and ask your questions. So number three is our Facebook group. You can do a search on Facebook for learning to code. That's what the Facebook group is called. I'm going to create a link and put it in this document where you can download this document, you can view it. Uh, it's also going to either be in the comments or in additional downloadable content. So you can find the link in there, or you can just hop on Google, type in learning to code, and you should ideally find that Facebook group. If you have not joined our Facebook group yet, I highly recommend that you do. There are tons of great developers on there. There are senior devs like myself who have been around for, you know, 20 odd years. Uh, we know a thing or two about a thing or two we can most likely answer all of your questions. So please, uh, if you have Facebook, come join us. Uh, all you have to do is in your Facebook search bar, type in learning to code. And you will find our group right here. It's the one that sort of says learning to code. When you hover over it, it actually says learning to code. Click into it and uh, just join. Uh, you might be prompted to answer two or three very basic questions. Um, they're not difficult questions. It's really just to make sure that uh, bots and spam stay out. So please answer those questions. Um, other than that, yeah, definitely come join us in our Facebook group. All right, while we're on the subject of editors, there's one other editor I mean, there's a few actually online uh, through your browser that you can use, but there's one in particular that I really want you to get familiar with, and that's CodePen. So I'm just going to make this bigger, and let's head over to CodePen.io. And what this does is lets you create these little interactive snippets of code where you can actually see your changes in real time. So let's create a new pen. We have div hello. So we've got our HTML in there. We've got our CSS in here. So we can say any div and we can change the color of all divs to blue, for example, and see it takes effect immediately. Font size, 20 pixels, gets a little bigger. Font weight, bold, by the way, you don't need to know what all these are. We're going to learn about all of these later. I just want to show you that like these are actually taking effect. And if you know any JavaScript at this point, you can also write some JavaScript in here too. So there we go. It says alerts test, and then you can just save it and it'll give you a special URL. So this is just asking me to log in. CodePen is totally free, by the way. You don't actually have to sign up for it. Um, but if you want to like save your pens, if you want to be able to edit them, um, yeah, then you're going to want to sign up. Again, it's free. It's a great service to use. And so this gives me the special URL. So if I just copy this and go into a new page and load it up, it's going to ask me to log in again. But you can see that all my code is in here. So whenever you're sharing code, whenever you have a question, whenever something's not actually working the way it's supposed to work, uh, if you want to ask either in the Facebook group or if you want to ask in any Facebook group, actually, or if you want to um, leave a message down below, uh, I don't know. If you want to share some code with somebody, use this service. This is probably the best one by far. It just, it takes the cake. So learn how to use CodePen. Again, super simple. HTML on the left, CSS in the middle, JavaScript on the right. And as you type, it automatically updates for you. I mean, it's as simple as that. So get familiar with it and make sure you use it because uh, if you ask me to evaluate a bunch of your code and it's just in plain text, um, or if it's on Facebook and it's like, you know, 50 lines of code that is not indented, it's not highlighted, it doesn't have any sort of syntax highlighting like what CodePen has, then you know what? Nobody's going to read that. So 
do everyone a favor, including yourself, get used to CodePen, put your code on CodePen, and feel free to share pieces of uh, like snippets of code on CodePen. How to ask questions. Okay, so this is actually super important. And so we're going to go over it right now. And that's how to ask questions, not just how to ask questions, but how to ask good questions. Okay, so the first thing you need to do in order to ask a good question is to know what the problem is. If you can't phrase what the problem is, if you don't know how to describe what the problem is to somebody else, you're not going to be able to get an answer. So you need to be clear on the problem. So be clear on the problem. And so that's, you know, step number one is you have to be able to ask what the question actually is. You need to be able to communicate with, with other people what the problem is. Step number two is if you have details, add them. So add, add as many details as possible. Uh, but just make sure they're relevant. Don't, don't tell us the entire project. Don't give us all the unused code. Don't give us code that is, you know, has nothing to do with your HTML, CSS, or JavaScript, or whatever you're working on. Just give us the relevant code. And so step number three would be uh, to spell details, right? Uh, step number three is spelling. So you have to make sure that you are spelling things properly, because if you're not spelling your sentences properly, if you're not spelling your questions properly, if you're using poor grammar, guess what? People are not going to spend a lot of time to answer those. The most answered questions on Stack Overflow, the most questions, the most answered questions really anywhere, including Facebook, including our Facebook dev group. Well, guess what? They're all the ones that actually have a well-worded, uh, grammatically correct question. So, you know, spelling is really important. Very, very important. Now, the fourth and probably the most important part of asking a good question, the most important one is as and I really mean this in the nicest way is to go and Google the question. Google your problem first. Chances are somebody's already had a very similar problem or the exact same problem. Had, and the answer might be on stackoverflow.com. Uh, the answer might be in some other developer forum. The answer might already be in our Facebook dev group. All you have to do is search for it. So spend five minutes and search for your problem. If you cannot absolutely find any help whatsoever within, I would say, 15 minutes max, then ask your question. But chances are, if you have a question at this stage in your development career, uh, it's already been asked. It's probably been asked, you know, 100,000 times already. So you don't need to ask again because someone else probably already has a great answer for you. So again, I mean, I mean this in the nicest way, but make sure you Google your problem first. Uh, that'll also help you uh, like specify what your problem actually is. It'll help you with wording. It'll help you uh, with grammar and spelling and all that stuff because you'll see other people's work as well. So in order to ask great questions, be clear on your problem, add as many details as you possibly can, relevant details that is, uh, make sure your spelling is accurate, uh, you're using proper grammar, and most importantly, make sure you Google the problem first. Hey guys, and welcome back to JavaScript Essentials. In this lesson, we're going to quickly go over where you should place your JavaScript. Now, there's a lot of debate about if you should put your JavaScript in the head of your HTML or in the body, uh, near the top or the bottom of your body. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly go over when you should put your JavaScript in which area. The first part is our head. So this is where you put, you know, your title. And that's just, you know, basic HTML. We all know that. But if you wanted to, you could also put some JavaScript in here. Now I'm going to write some inline JavaScript and you can write anything in here. This is just regular JavaScript. You don't have to worry about knowing what this is right now, but know that you can put JavaScript in the head. That being said, I would highly advise against doing that uh, just because a lot of JavaScript relies on the DOM, the document object model, which is basically your HTML structure. Now, if you have any JavaScript that's loading in the head, right, just like CSS, your browser is going to load your page from top to bottom. So if in here 
your JavaScript is trying to grab an element that has not been rendered yet in the body, which is in here, then it's either going to produce an error or it's going to give you unpredictable results. And that really depends on how fast your page can load, how fast the JavaScript can load, how fast the user's computer is. There's too many variances that we just can't control. So generally speaking, when you have to work with anything that's in the DOM, don't put it in the head, put it in the body. Now there are two places in the body where you can put it. So you can have, you know, your regular HTML in here, and you can put your JavaScript, you know, in here at the top. And for some scripts like analytics, that might be best because Google Analytics, for example, will ask you to put it at the top of your body element. And Google Analytics, all it is is JavaScript. Now, the reason that they ask you to put it at the top is simply because it doesn't rely on anything else for a little while. It can take a second, it can load, often it's asynchronous, so it's not going to slow anything down anyways. If you click a button, Google Analytics doesn't necessarily fire at that time, uh, unless you're doing some custom analytics work, but really, until then, not a big deal. Now, JavaScript that you write is most likely going to be working with your DOM. It's going to be working with... Uh, any sort of HTML that you've already written that your page is going to load, whether that's through Python or PHP or Node.js, any sort of JavaScript that's in your DOM needs to be loaded before you can grab it. And that's why you put your JavaScript in here. Now, what this has done for me, all I did was type script tab. Uh, that's just a little plugin for the browser that I'm using. I'm using Sublime. The plugin is called Emmet. It's really nice. Not the point right now. But what this does is it allows me to quickly type something out, hit tab, and it auto completes. So you're going to see a lot of that throughout the rest of this class. Now, in here, we have our type, text is equal to JavaScript, which we didn't use up here because our browser knows that this is a script. This is only going to be JavaScript. The only type of script your browser can ever run is JavaScript. The front end web developer stack only ever has three languages, and technically they're not all actually languages. You have HTML, which is markup. You have CSS, which is, you know, essentially markup. Although it's getting a lot more complex these days, and you can start adding variables. That's not quite in the spec yet as of uh, mid-2017, but variables are coming. That's going to be very cool. And JavaScript, which has probably made the most progress since it was born over 20 years ago. I'm getting a little off track here. This bottom part here where it says script type is equal to text slash JavaScript, we want to put SRC is equal to JavaScript.js. And all this does is say, look, Mr. Browser, whichever one you are, you're going to load a script for me. Load this one. And in our JavaScript.js file, we do not need to have our script in there. Now, moving forward, we're not going to actually write any JavaScript inline on our page. We might do it in the browser. We might do it in CodePen, somewhere a little more interactive. If I have to, I'm going to use Sublime, but generally I'm going to try to stay away from that. Uh, the reason for that is JavaScript is meant to be interactive, and I think teaching uh, in a more interactive environment is going to be better for the overall learning experience. So to quickly top this off, where should you put your JavaScript? Well, if you're uncertain, always put it just before your closing body tag. Don't put it in the middle of your page. Don't put it at the top of your body tag. Don't even put it in your header. If you're uncertain, put it at the bottom. Now, if you're using a, a library like jQuery, which you may or may not be familiar with at this point, but libraries should always be loaded at the bottom unless specifically told otherwise. There are some frameworks that say, yeah, you know, load your JavaScript library and it'll look a lot like this and just move it into the, the head of your script. And that's that's fine. If they tell you to do that, then absolutely do it that way. However, again, if you're uncertain, just take your entire script or the script's HTML line rather and just throw it at the bottom of your page. This way, your page can load everything. Your browser can load everything. And by time the JavaScript is ready to render, all your HTML is there. The only thing that's going to be missing is the closing body tag and the closing HTML tag, which JavaScript 
generally does not care about. It just wants opening tags, generally speaking. So that's that. Uh, to quickly wrap up, if you don't know where to put your JavaScript, put it at the bottom of any page. If you have to write any inline JavaScript, right, put it at the bottom of your page as well. Again, let that DOM, that document object model load. Hello, welcome back. Today we are going to be talking about the dreaded variables. Now variables actually aren't as bad as people think they are when they first start programming. A variable is really just a way to hold information in a way that's a little easier to memorize. The tricky part comes when you start talking about different data types. Now, data types is something we're also going to talk about in this lesson, but for the time being, let's just stick with a regular variable, right? So a variable looks a lot like this. You declare it with var, or in JavaScript, you don't necessarily need the var. However, just for uh, learning purposes, we're going to stick with var, and we're going to say name is equal to Caleb. Now, this is what declaring a variable looks like. You have your declaration, you have your variable name is equal to just one equal sign. That's important, and we'll talk about that in a later lesson. And then in here, we have uh, apostrophes, which could technically be replaced by quotation marks. Same thing and it ends in a semicolon. Now, the semicolon in JavaScript is completely optional. You don't you don't need to have it there, but if you're gonna write some clean code, it's a good idea to have it there. Um, there are some standards out there that prefer if you have it. Again, not really necessary. In the future, if you're going to be writing a programming language like uh, PHP, for example, every line in PHP has to end in a semicolon. So getting in the habit of writing a semicolon versus not writing the semicolon is a good idea. Now. If you choose to, to learn Python in the future, Python does not end in a semicolon. It just has a blank line. In fact, Python looks a lot like this. Now, this is not a Python course, but I'm just showing you, uh, or I'm demonstrating that there are different ways to do this. Moving forward in this class, we are always going to have a semicolon at the end of every line. I might miss a couple here or there, but JavaScript is uh, not strict enough to complain about that unless there's obviously a good reason to, uh, but I always try to put a semicolon at the end. Now, for this lesson, I'm actually going to do a little bit more inside of the browser itself so that you can see that you can actually write JavaScript inside of your browser. So I'm going to create a new file. I'm just going to call it index.html. Okay, so I have my index.html file, and all I did was add some basic HTML structure. We're not going to write JavaScript in here. I'm just going to go ahead and open this inside of Chrome, though. All right, so in Chrome, there's absolutely nothing fancy about this. All we're going to do is right-click, go to Inspect, and you can do this in pretty much any browser. And I'm just going to change this to be on the right. And in here, we have Elements, Console, Sources, Network, Performance, Memory, etc., etc. What we want is Console. And right in here, you can actually type your JavaScript right into the browser. So if we say variable name is equal to Caleb, and hit enter, it says undefined. In all honesty, it's lying to you. It's not undefined. So if we go ahead and type name, we get Caleb, right? This is a variable. That means that the variable name, N-A-M-E, has a value called Caleb. Now, if you remember back to your math days where uh, your teacher would say, find the value of X, and X would be nine or 3.14, some number, right? Those are variables. Now, don't get discouraged. This is really as much math as we're going to be doing for quite a while. Uh, the math in JavaScript does not get very extensive unless you want to get into charts or animation libraries or anything like that. Uh, but for what we're doing, the math is, is super simple, so you don't have to be afraid of that at all. Now, there is a difference between different types of variables. For example, variable age, I could say 27, right? Again, I hit enter, it says undefined, but if I type age, it says 27. But what happens if I type variable age two, right? It tries to autofill for me, you can see that. Age two is equal to, and I put it in quotations. If I put this in quotations, again, it says undefined, but if I say age two, the difference is that one, is just a number, an integer, and the other one 
has quotations around it. Now that is a pretty big difference and this is the difference between a data type. Don't be concerned with memorizing all of this. We're going to get a lot more hands on with this a little bit later um, and for the time being you really just need to know that there are different types of, of variables out there, different data types. So what we've experienced so far, name would be a string. Now anything with quotations around it or with apostrophes around it is called a string. If it doesn't have quotations, if it's a full number, it's called an integer. But what if we have variable pi is equal to 3.14 something something something, right? And we type pi again. Now this looks a lot like an integer, but technically it's not an integer. Well, I mean, it is, but because it has a decimal point in it, it's actually called a float. Now, a float is basically just a number that has a decimal point. And if you remember back to your, your math days, 3.0 is the exact same as 3. However, when we're talking about being the exact same in programming, 3.0 is not the exact same. Actually, let me type that different. It is not the exact same as 3. This one here, just 3, is an integer. And 3.0 is a float. Is that incredibly important at the time? No. Uh, and maybe throughout your JavaScript future as, as a JavaScript developer, it might never come up. However, uh, when we get into comparisons, how, how do we compare if three is equal to three or if something is true or false, right? Those types of comparisons, we're going to get into those. And all of a sudden, this is going to make a lot more sense. So just bear with me for the time being. It's important to know this now. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but it's very important to know. Now there's another one, ah, as you can see, actually, I, I hit enter just to make a new line and it says false. Uh, but if we did uh, three is equal to three, that's true. Again, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, there's another type of data out there, a uh, data type called null. Uh, so we could just say variable, we'll call it something. Uh, and actually it's not null. Uh, this has been defined. Um, but the value is undefined. And so we see this everywhere else. Uh, technically, this value name is not undefined, but something is undefined because we didn't write something is equal to something else, which that actually would have broke because there were no strings. Now, when we are declaring a variable as a string, we have variable string, we have to have quotations or quotes around it. It doesn't matter which one as long as they are the same. So you open with a, a quotation, something, you end with a quotation, type string, that's the variable name that we typed, that we declared, and we get the value. Now I'm just going to go ahead and clear this. Now what happens when we try to declare a string without quotations or apostrophes, right? We do variable something else is equal to, and we can just write anything that would be a string, right? So it's not a number, it's not a float, uh, it's not an object or array, we'll get to those. It's supposed to be a string, like a sentence, but it doesn't have quotations around it. So we say, hello, my name is Caleb, and we get a syntax error, unexpected identifier, identifier and that's because something else thinks it's referencing another variable technically called hello and the space breaks the whole process. Now when it comes to declaring a variable, uh, there are lots of different ways you can do it. You can camel case, right? So camel casing is you start with a lowercase letter and every word after that put together into one long word has a capital, camel casing. Or for example, hello, my name is Caleb. That's camel casing. I'm just going to make that bigger, actually. There's another way to, to name your variable variables, and you can use underscores. Hello, my name is Caleb. Now, you can't actually see that. There we go. Uh, I have underscores in there. Is equal to test. Now, why does this bring up the... The, the string when I defined it here, but in previous examples, it always it always said undefined 
Well, the reason it was undefined was because we were using var and var has a a hoisting mechanism um, and I think that's going to be something we talk about in the future uh, just because hoisting is sort of unique to JavaScript but it, it, it's it's just one of those things that's good to know because eventually you're going to run into a problem where it's like why is why is my anonymous function or why is my variable not being defined or or why is it being defined but it has nothing in it yet and that, that's called hoisting we'll get into that later don't worry about that Going back to naming conventions, uh, you could name any variable, literally anything you want. I spelled that wrong. Anything you want. However, there are some exceptions. Do not write a variable, like don't start a variable name with a number. In most languages, that's not allowed, not to mention it's a bad practice. So don't say for something or 40 year old. That's, that's not good. Don't do that. Uh, in JavaScript, you'll see a lot of variables that start with an underscore. Totally acceptable. That's fine. Also, do not use dashes. No dashes. So don't use dashes. Uh, and in fact, don't use any other punctuation either. It's unnecessary. So uh, don't use dashes is equal to see it gave us an error uncut syntax error invalid or unexpected token what it thinks right now is that this is being escaped again a subject we'll talk about in the future not important right now uh, and it also thinks that this is the variable essentially and it can't figure out what's going on after it or why there's a slash there so it throws you an error now there's there's another one I want to talk about real quick, and again we're getting quite a quite a bit ahead of our, ourselves, but again these are good to know because we're going to be practicing these in the future, and they're going to make more sense once you actually start writing some code. So we have objects, we have arrays, we have undefined, we have null, int, float, and strings. So the next one I want to talk about objects. Say obj is equal to, and it starts with a curly brace, ends with a curly brace, or bracket if you want to call it that. You have some sort of key, you have some sort of value, you have key two, whoops, another value. Notice how these all look like strings. I hit enter and it gives me an object and that's something that we can actually use here. So the proto, don't worry about this, that's a lot of JavaScript functionality that comes with the object data type. We're not going to modify these or add any of these. But what's cool about OBJ, and this is where the power of object oriented programming comes in, is we can type OBJ dot and automatically we have key and key2 in here. So if we type OBJ dot key, that's the value, right? We said key is equal to with a colon value but we also said obj.key2 is another value ah, let's just capitalize that and i'm going to show you that you don't necessarily need to have your key in a string Let's say 27.8 or whatever that would roughly round to. I hit enter and again I've got name and age. Even if you noticed up here when I had the key as a string, it automatically turned it into a key. Uh, so that's basically a string or like uh, a variable name without the quotations around it. It's unnecessary in an object. And so an object is a way of storing variables inside of other variables, but then you can name them as well. So you have all of these uh, different data points inside of one variable. Now this is really, really powerful when it comes to storing information about one particular data object. So it clears this and let's create a person object, right? We have person is equal to object. Uh, let's say the name 
Okay, we're, I'm just going to create uh, a person object for myself. Age, we did this already, but this is this is a different object because we call we're calling it person. Uh, and I don't know what what is my favorite color? Maybe right? We're going to say red. So I type that in. I hit enter. The console in our browser has now stated that, oh yeah, this exists. So now I can type person dot name. Oh, look at that. That's my name, person dot age. If I type that right, that probably would have worked. Person dot age. Not going to lie, it's a little bit embarrassing. I type the word page so many times, I guess it's just habit. Person dot, pa uh, dot age. There we go. <clears throat> Third time's the charm. And uh, let's try person dot color. We have red. Beautiful. But what happens if we just type person? We get the whole object. But we can't use that in a page. And again, we're going to get some hands-on experience with that in the future. Uh, but right now, it's just good to know that, hey, we can store multiple data points inside of one object. So you could have your friend Kyle, for example, is equal to an object full of data points. And now you don't have to remember, uh, you know, 200 different variables. Uh, you can just remember that every object named Kyle or person or whatever you want to name it has these different sub variables. That, that's a good way of putting it. Sub variables inside of a variable. Now, when we talk about arrays, right, we had, remember, we had objects and we had arrays. The last one was an object. An array is a list of variables. Now, it's different from an object because an object very specifically has person dot name or person dot whatever variable you give it, whereas an array is simply a list. So we could say friends is equal to, and we're just going to create uh, an array. This way, we use two hard brackets, and inside of it, we have a bunch of strings or uh, ints or floats. Basically, you just declare a bunch of variables in a list uh, that's all separated by commas. Very simple. So let's go ahead and delete that. And my friends are going to be Nathan, Prairie, and Zephyr. I hit enter. And this gives us something a little bit different. We haven't seen this one yet. We have 0, 1, 2. These are the keys. And it's sort of like an object, but we can't really rename these keys. Uh, if we did rename them, essentially, we'd be working with an object. Is simply a list. Now, we saw right here, zero is Nathan. In computer programming, when we start counting, it always starts at zero. So zero is actually one, one is actually two, two is actually three. Only in human language do we start counting at one, but computers, they start at zero. So if I type friends and curly brackets to, uh, not curly brackets, sorry, like these hard brackets, that's telling JavaScript, okay, so I'm looking for a friends array, which is what we wrote up here, and I'm looking for the very first piece of information that's in there. So if I go ahead and hit enter, what should come back is the name Nathan, just as we expected. Now, if I type friends2, what do you think is going to be returned? If you think the name Zephyr is going to be returned, you're absolutely right. Now, here's a tricky one. What happens when you type friends three? We know that three doesn't exist in here. So what is going to be returned? Undefined. Now in JavaScript, if you were trying to access a variable or a data point that does not exist, it's going to be undefined every single time. And we can see this as being a true statement uh, let's actually type that correctly. Friends three is equal to undefined. If this turns out to be true, uh, as in friends three, the, the third or uh, the fourth item in this array does not exist, this is going to pop the little word true underneath, just like that. So now you know about objects, you know about arrays, you know about strings, ints, Int is short for integers and floats. Oh, and I lied. Uh, and undefined. Now, these are 
just variables. The way I declared them in here is the exact same way that you can declare them in your JavaScript, whether that's your internal JavaScript on your page, variable ABC is equal to one, two, three. It's the exact same way. Or if you're in just a, a regular JS file, you could say age is equal to 27.8. We know that, you know, this is a float because it has that decimal point. And we know that if we remove the decimal point, that there's going to be, uh, that this is going to be an integer. Now, what I would like you to do for, uh, for just a little bit of practice, there's, there's, there's no homework here, uh, but I would like you to get a little bit of practice. So just open up a blank index HTML file. I just call it index. It could be any HTML file. It could actually be any page anywhere. Uh, you can open up Facebook if you wanted to. Right click, go to inspect or inspect elements, to, depending on the browser that you're using. Uh, go over to console and just start typing some JavaScript. Declare some variables. So uh, declare the variable uh, my age is equal to whatever your age is. You know, if you're 15 or if you're 45, and hit enter. Just see what happens. And then type. And you can type uh, your integers, your floats, your strings. Uh, you can see if there are any errors. You can sort of learn what works, what doesn't work. And while you're doing that, type your, your variables in and see if it, it turns out, uh, if it spits out exactly what you are expecting. And if it's not what you're expecting, well, then you can figure out why. You can ask why. And remember, if you have questions, ask in our Facebook group. Uh, what I would like you to do is create an object, create an array. Remember, an array is just a list. Create one string, one integer, and uh, create one float. Do that in your console, and you will be very familiar with variables. Uh, we're going to get into comparisons a little bit down the road, and that's when these variables are, are going to really come to life, and you're going to be able to see things. I know that this lesson right now is, is a little bit dry. Uh, it's not super exciting or anything. Um, this is a fundamental concept, pretty much every programming language. And it's really, really important to know how these work because this is transferable. What you're learning in this lesson is not just JavaScript. It works in PHP, in Python, in Node, in every other language. There are, there are basically uh, objects, arrays, strings, integers, and floats. There are actually a bunch of other ones depending on the language that you're writing, but these are the most common ones that are completely transferable. So it's really, really good to know how these work. So uh, go ahead. Give that a shot. If you get stuck, ask questions. We're here to help. Otherwise, uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Hello, and welcome to this course. My name is Caleb. I'm your instructor for this course, and I am the face behind all of the videos. Uh, very soon, if they haven't already, Udemy is going to prompt you and ask you to leave a review. And I would love if you could kindly leave a review at this point. I know it's a little bit early and a lot of people don't know if they love this course yet. And that's actually okay because Udemy is going to prompt you right now and they're going to prompt you at the end of the course to maybe make a, uh, to, to make a change on your review. If you have any ideas for improvement, definitely send me a private message on Udemy, uh, and I'm happy to take all sorts of feedback and, and make positive changes to the course. So if you have any ideas, definitely let me know. Because my goal here uh, is to not make a four-star course. Uh, four-star reviews are my enemy. I want to make five-star courses. I want to make amazing courses that people absolutely love. And that only works when you give me some feedback. So if you have any complaints or if you were thinking about leaving a negative review, uh, maybe just send me a message first and I'll see if I can make any immediate changes um, because it just it might be something small that you don't like that I can make uh, an immediate change uh, to help you change your mind. So in summary, don't forget to leave a review. It's very, very important for me as an instructor on Udemy uh, that you actually review the course. And... Um, yeah, that's it. So thank you very much. Uh, please leave a review. It's super, super important. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Hey, it's me, Caleb, the voice behind the screen. I just want to pop my head in real quick and ask, how are you doing? Are things going all right? Are you getting stuck anywhere? Do you have any questions? Uh, if you have questions, guess what? You can answer them. Uh, nobody's going to judge you for asking a question. Uh, it's really the only way to actually get an answer. I mean, you're never going to know unless you ask. 
So if you're stuck, ask a question. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the Facebook developer support group as well called Learning to Code. Uh, we have thousands of people, thousands of developers who are you know, eager to help out just like I am. And uh, just you know, maybe send me a message and say, hey, Caleb, I'm getting stuck on something. Otherwise, if you're doing extremely well in this course, I would like to hear about it. What is going really, really well? Uh, if there is a comment section down below, maybe go ahead, leave a nice little comment about what's going really well, what you really like, uh, and start a conversation with the group. And I will absolutely contribute to that as well. Hello, welcome back. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to be talking about string manipulation, which basically is we take a string, uh, usually in a variable, in a string type, uh, in a string data type, and we change the value of it dynamically, or we get some sort of information from it. Uh, these are basically these are called methods uh, again because JavaScript is an object-oriented programming language. We use this thing called dot notation that allows us to access functions that are attached to strings or objects or arrays, things like that. So in this example, what I'm going to do is just create a very simple string. And I'm just going to call it str is equal to, and we could fill this with anything. So if, if you're following along, if you're typing along while I'm doing this too, feel free to enter anything in here. The blue blanket is sitting on the desk. Nice and simple. So when we type that back, str, we have the blue blanket is sitting on the desk. Nothing fancy. We know how to do that. Caleb, this is boring. I know, I know. Now let's go ahead and see how many characters are in this, how many letters are in this. So if we type str.length, and you can tell that our browser is telling us that the length has to be from a string here, right? Or at least it's coming from a string. If we type enter, 39. There are 39 characters in here, not including the quotations. Those quotations are simply to show you that it's a string. Now, why is that important? Well, because one day when a user inputs some sort of information on your site, for example, Twitter, where you can only have 140 characters, it's important to make sure that their sentences or their tweet is only 140 characters. And this is the first form of validation. They would say, if the tweet is, uh, if the tweet length is less than or equal to 140, then they can go ahead and execute some more code. So now that's just finding a length. Pretty simple stuff. But what happens when we want to find a string inside of a string? So let's say we're looking for the word blanket. How do we find that? We could rip apart every single word and compare it in a loop, and it gets way too complicated. Things that you don't even know about yet really are completely unnecessary at this point. We can try this. String dot index of, and let's put the word blanket in here. Nine. What nine means is that at the ninth letter in this sentence is where the word blanket is found. So we have T-H-E and the word blue. Together that's seven plus the spaces, the two spaces before the letter B in blanket totals nine. So that's, that's where the word starts. Now, if the word does not exist, what happens? If we type string index of, and let's type the word red because there is no word red in, in our string. We get minus one. So if something does not exist, we get minus one. Now, do you think this is case sensitive or case insensitive? We haven't talked about this yet in JavaScript. So I want to know what you think. Is this case sensitive or case insensitive? Let's go ahead and test this out. String index of, and let's type the word blanket, but with a capital B. So it's different from this one. This one has a lowercase b, this one has an uppercase b. And let's see what the difference actually is when I hit enter. It does not exist. Now, that in itself can become very problematic because you're not going to check every possible variation of the word blank with different capitalization on different letters. That's, it's not impossible. It's just a lot of work. And that's something you definitely want to stay away from. Programming is not meant to be a lot of work. It is meant to be nice and simple. So what do we do? We take string and we can turn the entire sentence into lowercase or the entire sentence into uppercase. For what we're testing here, it doesn't really matter. We just have to change what we're looking for exactly. So uh, as a first example, let's change this to lowercase string dot to lowercase. 
and you have these rounded brackets here, these parentheses. Now these parentheses means it's running a function or a method. And you see it here too. This one take, takes the parameter of blanket, red, blanket again. This one, uh, dot length, is not a method. That comes when a string is formed. So it's actually a data point inside of it. And now you can tell that string is technically not a string, but it acts a lot like an object. Just like when we wrote in the last lesson that uh, name, or uh, sorry, the person object has a name and an age and a favorite color, right? And we said person.name or person.age. This is string.length or string dot whatever that other value is going to be. Very object oriented here. Now going back to our example, string to lowercase changes everything to lowercase. Well, there's only one letter in there. So this is actually a very bad example, uh, but the, the first letter that was capitalized is no longer capitalized. Now what happens when we type str? It's back to normal. Now why is that? It's because it took your string, your sentence, it turned it lowercase and returned that value. We didn't store that in another variable. So let's type str lower is equal to str to, to lowercase. And this is just a simple variable name and that's in camel case and str lower and now we have this accessible at any point in time because we've assigned another variable now if we tried str lower dot index of and instead of typing blanket with a capital b we know that all these letters every letter in this sentence is going to be lowercase we also check lowercase it gives us a positive number that means it exists or rather it gives us a non-negative number and that means it exists. Now, on the inverse, we can try this. String upper, new variable, is equal to string dot to uppercase. Now we could use string or we can use string lower. It doesn't matter because it's going to take all the letters and turn them into uppercase letters. It's gonna capitalize everything. So let's try this. As you can see, the blue blanket is sitting on the desk and now we have all uppercase letters. It's exactly what we want because if we did string dot index of and we typed blanket in all caps, that still doesn't exist because str is set to be the proper way. It is still it is still the same variable. Now we can override this and variables, the beautiful thing about variables is, is you can override them at basically any point in time. Now I just hit the up arrow to get my last command there and if I type string upper dot index of it's looking for blanket in the string uppercase string uppercase we turned uh, the lowercase version to uppercase so it's trying to match this blanket with this blanket and it found it at the ninth character now that's how you find a string inside of a string is that important in a lot of cases yes that's very important you're going to want to find strings inside of strings that is not an uncommon task. I know, again, not the most exciting thing in the world. And we haven't even started really modifying anything on the DOM, the document object model, uh, which is our web page. So we see on the left here, we have this big white box. Nothing has changed. And that's fine. We need to learn the principles before we can get to the fun stuff. Thankfully, the principles of programming don't actually take very long to learn. And the more languages you learn, the easier it is to pick up other languages. And again, Things like index of, while the function might be different in other languages, the concept of trying to find a capitalized word like this one, blanket, in a string that is all capitalized is the same across every language. Now, I'm just going to clear this, type str again so that we can see what we're working with. What if we wanted to change str uh, to instead be the blue blanket is sitting on the desk to just be a fragment of that. Well, I don't want to overwrite this yet because I'm still going to be using the str, the string variable. So instead, I'm going to write abc because I don't care what the variable name is at the moment, str.substring. Now we have two methods here. We're going to stick with the first one, substring, and this takes two parameters, where to start and where to end. Now, where should this start? Well, if we want to start at the very first letter, that remember, this is the first one, and that's how we talk in human languages, but in programming languages, the first is the number zero. 
comma, and then our second parameter. And where do we want to get? Well, we knew from the previous example that this here was the first nine letters. And we could also count that out if we wanted to. But what if we wanted to get uh, from, you know, the blue blanket is sitting on the desk from the blue blanket to somewhere in here. Now I'm just going to put in a random number. I'm going to put no thought into this just to show you how this works. We know that this is 39 characters long because we did string dot length and we got 39. I hit enter and I get the blue blanket is. In fact, actually, I want it to be a little bit longer. Uh, so instead, I'm going to overwrite this and I'm going to put it as 29. There we go. The blue blanket is sitting O. So we have from here all the way here is 29 characters. And we can see that when we when we substring 0 to 29. Now you don't have to start with 0. You can do substring and let's start at 10 and go to the next 10. So this is going to start at technically letter number 11 and is going to get the next 10 after that. Now we get blank it is. Look at that. So that's substring. Now is that important? In times, yes, that's very important. At other times, I mean, there are other methods to do this. You can also use string.slice. Let's check out what slice does. 10 and 15. So we entered string.slice and it starts at 10 and it's going to end at 15. The difference is substring starts at 10 and gets the next 10, whereas slice starts at 10 and ends at 15 starting from 0. Now, both slice and string don't require two parameters. They just need one. One is mandatory. So if I said abc is equal to string.substring, uh, let's start that one at 12. It's going to start at 12, which is right there, and it's going to get the remainder. And if I typed abc is equal to string.substring, a negative number, let's say minus 20, it's going to start here and work its way back. Now slice is going to essentially do the exact same thing. If we type in slice 15, it starts at 15, goes to the end of the string. Or string dot slice minus 15 starts at the back. Let me clear that again and show you what we're working with. Now just a minute ago when we said abc is equal to string dot substring whatever the value was we overwrote abc over and over and over again and that changes value over and over and over again so that demonstrates how variables from our previous lesson are easily overwritten all you have to do is type the same variable name is equal to something else and you overwrite it now what happens if you want to replace a string inside of a string well JavaScript is pretty straightforward, so we just use dot replace, and we look for a word. Again, this is going to be case sensitive. We know that JavaScript is case sensitive from a previous example. And instead of using bl blanket, let's type pillow. So replace is looking for the word blanket, and it's going to try to replace it with the word pillow. What happens? The blue pillow is sitting on the desk. But what happens? If the word is not found, what does it return? Uh, so we don't want to look for the word blanket. Instead, we want to look for any other word. Let's look for car and replace that with pillow. What happens? It just returns your string because nothing was replaced. It's just going to replace your string inside your string and return the entire thing back to you. Now, here's one more thing is with strings, we can concatenate them. That means to take one string, one sentence, and append it to another string or sentence. Now, here's one more thing, is with strings, we can concatenate them. That means to take one string, one sentence, and append it to another string or sentence. Let's type uh, intro as the variable name is equal to, hello, my name is, and that's all it's going to be. And I'm also going to create another variable named Caleb. So now we have intro. We have name. How do we put these together? This is a process called concatenation, or concat for short. To merge these strings together, 
there are various different ways to do this in JavaScript, but the most popular one is to use the plus symbol. So let's create a new variable and it's called sentence is equal to intro plus name. Now this looks like it's math, but it's not. And this is why data types are very, very important. When we add a string together using this plus symbol, we're not actually adding anything together. What we're doing is we're joining them together. So if I hit enter on this, we should get, hello, my name is Caleb, just like that. Now, anytime I type sentence, the variable sentence, we get, hello, my name is Caleb. Now, why did that happen? Why, why is it when we type 12 plus 20, we get 32, but when we type hello plus something, it merges the sentences together. The strings are put together. Now, in our last lesson, we talked about data types, and I keep bringing this up. And this is why data types are important to know. In languages like PHP, PHP doesn't really care too much. It'll try to add a string with a number, and it will fail because it's very loosely written. In Python, in JavaScript, in Node, that's unacceptable. These are more strict languages, meaning that you can only add integers with integers or integers with floats because you can add numbers with other numbers, but you cannot add a sentence with a number. It doesn't work that way. When you add one sentence with another sentence, it becomes one long sentence. But what happens if we try to apply some other math? Let's type, uh, let's put the word long in here and multiply, multiply this by 20. We get this beautiful little thing called NAN, not a number, it stands for not a number. Now, why do we get this? Because you cannot multiply the word or the string long 20 times. You can't multiply letters and numbers. They don't mix. It's like oil and water. They just don't mix, unfortunately. And so that's why learning your data types is very important because if you ever get this, now you know that, oh, one of my variables is probably not an integer or is not a float. And for that reason, I need to change something. Now we might be getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but I want to show you one more thing. I'm going to type number, uh, actually let's change that name. Uh, the num is equal to, uh, let's say 500, uh, sorry, 315. We know that's a string because it has quotations around it. What if we did the num times 20? JavaScript is smart enough to realize that in this string, is actually a number and it did the multiplication for us. So that's acceptable. But what if, I'm just gonna overwrite this, the num is equal to 315 is the number. So now we have a new string in there and we type the num times 20. Again, we get not a number because JavaScript looks at this as a whole and says, okay, well, I know there's a number in there, but this whole thing is not a number. So that's unacceptable. So I'm gonna throw you a new little error or I'm going to return the value called not a number to you. Now, if you wanted to uh, actually be quite the stickler with your data types, and this is a very good thing, if you wanted to be very clean with your data types, I would say by all means go for it as long as it doesn't make your code too bloated. So if we go back and we say the num is equal to 315, but that's in a string, and we wanted to convert that, because if we type the num now, it's still in a string, but if we said the num is equal to number the num and we're pa just passing a simple variable in there and we're actually passing itself type enter now we have just a number and you can tell because there's no quotations the color even changed it's not red it's blue now and every time we type the num it's 315. so that's a quick way of parsing i guess your strings that are only holding numbers into a legitimate integer I'm just going to go ahead and clear this, and we're going to do one more example. And we're going to turn a string into an array. So we type string, or str. We have our original string. We've never overwritten this. And if we put in uh, a new variable, let's call it arr, short for array, is equal to str.split. Where do we want to split this? Well, we want to break up each word, so we're just going to put a simple space in there. And what this is going to do is it's going to break on each little space inside of this string 
and everything in between each space is going to be an array value. I hit enter, it gives us eight. And now we can do uh, arr.length is eight. There's eight pieces in here, eight different words. Now arr.length, we know this from string. String.length gave us how many letters are in it, but array gives us how many different objects, or uh, objects is a, an ambiguous word but it gives us how many different pieces are in this list. And in this, we see that there are eight. So now if I just type ARR, I get uh, all of these together. And if I wanted to put these back together, instead of using split, we use join. Create a new variable called ARR joined and type ARR dot join. And what do we want to join it on? What is the glue that we want to put this broken sentence back together with? Well, we could put it back together with uh, a simple space or something, but let's do something a little more creative. Uh, if we use a dash, it looks a lot more like a URL. And now instead of spaces, we have dashes. And if we want to create uh, a URL from this, we type URL is equal to AR joined dot to lowercase. And now we have what looks like a URL fragment or a query string. So if you went to facebook.com slash, you know, the dash blue dash blanket dash is dash so on and so on, it looks a lot like a URL. So now we're, we're turning strings into what look like actual URLs. And this is very, very valuable when creating things like single page applications or taking user input, for example, uh, when someone creates a new Facebook page and turning that into a uh, a URL that will be in the you know the facebook.com slash whatever your your group or Facebook page name is. So now we're actually getting a lot more useful and we still haven't done anything with the DOM with with the actual HTML, but we're creating very useful things here. So again, not super super exciting, but incredibly useful. And these don't just stop here. There are tons and tons of other methods that we can use. If we just type str dot we get a long list of things that we can do in fact that's actually what i want you to do is in your console create a, a new string uh put a sentence in there could be anything make it about 40 ish characters like we did in this example in this video and let's just see what these do what happens when you type dot bold oh well it returns a function well that's interesting what is that that might be worth a little bit of a google but play around with some of these because these are all very, very useful. You can do the same thing with array. How we have an array here, error dot, and then it gives you a list of what you're looking for here. Do you want to concatenate these, bring these together? Do you want to uh, shift these, slice these, sort these? Uh, you could do all sorts of stuff in here. Now, JavaScript is not just limited to this function list. Like this list is, it's nice, it's convenient, but that's not everything JavaScript has to offer. So as your homework for this video, uh, go ahead, create a string, um, a type in whatever your variable name is, hit dot, and take a look at some of these. If any of these catch your eye, you're really interested in what they might possibly do, uh, go and Google them. Because here's one of the secrets to being a great web developer, and I'm not even kidding you. If you talk to any senior dev, they're all going to tell you this, that the the real superpower behind being a great developer is knowing how to ask questions and knowing how to Google. Because in the world of programming, front end and back end, there are so many things out there that you have to remember, you're not going to remember them all. Uh, that's just, that's a fact of life. Our brains don't work like that. And why remember it all when it's all easily accessible through the old Google machine? So go ahead, give that a shot. I uh, hope you've learned a lot of useful things in here. Uh, I hope that in the next few lessons, we start getting into something a little more, um, I guess, interesting where we can start manipulating the DOM and uh, really making your page a lot more interactive and dynamic. Hello, welcome back. Before we move on, what I actually want you to do is I want you to do a little project. It's, it's very simple. It's just working with what we have already learned. Um, I feel like what we have learned already could be considered a lot of information, especially if you're brand new to JavaScript. And so what we're going to do is we're going to turn uh, a little bit of text, a few variables into an actual URL. 
that you could possibly use in a project moving forward. So the idea is to take one, two, three, however, however many variables you need, manipulate them using uh, using replace, or uh, you could break it into an array and join it back together, like we did in a previous lesson. Turn your URL into all lowercase because all URLs should always be lowercase. That's a good practice. Uh, and then you want to add your website name in front of it. Now, if you don't have a website name, you could use any name. You could use google.com, facebook.com, uh, arcmont.com, whatever you really want. Your end result should really look like this. Now, there's two ways we can do this. Um, we could do it using a ton of the, the methods that we've already used which I think is the best way to do it, uh, just for practice. There is a simpler way, which is basically, um, you could just write str or any sort of variable name is equal to, and then you put it in there. That's uh, not what I want you to do, though. Um, I also don't want you to write, you know, string one plus string two. Uh, sort of, you know, this being string two and this one being string one. Uh, you know, don't do that either. Get creative with this take the long way around. This is one of those times where programming the long way, just experimenting, breaking things, and, you know, just writing a lot of code is completely acceptable. You're learning. And while you're learning, a great way to learn is to write a lot of code. Uh, and then in the future, optimize it. And that's perfectly fine. So if you want to stick around for a few more seconds, I'm actually going to do this myself uh, in a way that I think would be useful using some of the different methods that we've already used, uh, including concatenation, to split, to join, lowercase, uppercase, finding, replacing words. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit creative with it. I'm going to take a long way around. I'm going to have some fun with it. And uh, feel free to watch it. But if you really want to challenge yourself, uh, maybe pause the video here. Uh, give it a shot on your own. And then uh, once you have figured out or if you get stuck, then you know resume the video and play through the rest of it. All right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do this live right in the console. Uh, I could do this in Sublime so you have the code, um, but realistically, this is not, you know, super awesome code or anything that's really going to revolutionize uh, how the internet works. So it's not really, uh, it's not worth saving, um, but this is a really good practice run. So the goal was to create a website URL. Now I'm going to use various methods. The first one I'm going to do is figure out which website we're supposed to be going to. So I'm going to create a variable called website, and it's just going to be HTTPS arcmont.com with, with a trailing slash. Done. So now we have website. This is, in all honesty, cheating. We could do some funner things, but this is not the part that I want you to focus on. What I wanted you to focus on was creating the URL, and that URL could be coming from anything. So let's create a, a new string. And instead of using camel case, I'm using underscore this time just to show you that you can use a other, you know, variable naming conventions. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog or something along those lines. So you see that I've added uh, two extra spaces in here instead of just one. There's two in there. This is all capitals. This is, uh, I don't know why there's a capital C, capital K. Either way. We need to turn this into some sort of URL form. So now we have website and we have new string. So new string needs to turn into the URL. Well, the first thing I want to do with my new string is I want to turn this into something that I can manipulate no matter what down the line. So I'm going to say new string is equal to new string, which really is just taking itself and overriding itself to lowercase. Now we have no more capitalization problems. This is perfect. Now, if we wanted to run a search on this, we don't have to worry about uh, a random capital C in the middle of the word quick. But now let's say I wanted to remove any extra spaces. Let's say there are two or three extra spaces anymore, uh, anywhere, and let's say we just want to remove them. Now, we might not know that they're there, but it might be a good idea to, to go and replace those extra spaces anyways at this point. Um, there's two ways to do this. One way we didn't learn, uh, and the way that we did learn. The way we did learn was to use dot replace. And that's how we're going to use it, uh, just because that's what we've learned, and I want you to get some practice with that. 
The other way is to use what's called regular expressions, which is a crazy computer way of searching through anything and finding the exact pattern that you have specified. And we're not going to learn about that yet. This is a JavaScript essentials course. And, you know, only being uh, a few videos in, a few lessons into this course, you don't need to know about regex just yet. Regex is the way we say regular expressions. So next step to replace, say new string is equal to, uh, you know, what? let's not call it new string. That's, it's going to get confusing. URL is equal to new string dot. And we know we can use replace. And what do we want to replace? We want to replace extra spaces with just regular spaces. We can do that. Now type this and we've only got where there were two spaces between the and lazy. There's now only one URL is equal to URL dot. Um, nope, not splice split. We want to split all the spaces. Now we know that there are a bunch of spaces in here. Between each word, we've gotten rid of any extra spaces. What happens we get an array now URL is now an array, we can't do anything with that. And what would happen if we did website plus URL? Well, it automatically joined it together with commas, pretty close to what we want, but not quite. So let's do URL is equal to URL dot join. And let's join all of the the array pieces, all these different words, with a dash. Now look at that. So now our final product is going to be URL is equal to website plus URL, which is going to concatenate our website and our URL. And there we have an actual URL. Now, does this actually go anywhere? Honestly, it's probably never going to go anywhere. Maybe, I don't know. But that's not the point. The point is we have what looks like a legitimate URL based on what could have been user input. User input is never perfect. Never. Like if user input is perfect, that's very, very rare. Just assume that user input is always wrong, that it's always, uh, it always looks terrible, that it's not formatted properly. Just those kinds of assumptions, not to be negative or anything, are good assumptions. Just assume that content entered into your website is not what you expect it to be. And that is having a security first mindset. Now, after we concatenated website with URL, well, we have a legitimate looking URL here. And we could have done that with any sentence running through this with any other sentence would have worked. If you feel like you've got a grasp on what we've done here, then uh, I invite you to open up the, the next video. Let's keep digging into JavaScript. This is getting fun. This is getting exciting. And moving forward, this is only going to get better. Hello. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about comments. It's super quick, super brief. Really, there's not a whole lot to talk about here, to be honest. Uh, comments, what you have usually seen in HTML is a, a comment that looks a lot like this. In JavaScript, we don't use comments like that. We use comments. Actually, you've seen this before. If you've looked at any of the project files, uh, any of the JavaScript.js files, they all have this little double line here. I'm just going to move that in. And that's a comment. But how does it look in code? Well, uh, let's write some basic code. And I don't expect you to understand what this code actually is, nor do you have to right now. So I'm going to write something in here. Uh, it would be great if I could spell any of the words correctly. And, you know, what does this function do. Actually, I'm going to move this up one. And in here, uh, step one, you know, it's going to execute some code in here, whatever that might possibly be. Uh, and then step two, execute some more code. And then it's just going to return something, maybe it's going to return an object. So again, you don't need to know what that actually is. But here are the comments. Now, if we wanted to actually comment this whole thing out, what we could do is we could just add uh, the double slashes in front of it. Or we could do the easier way and use the asterisk and slash. So to start a, a single line comment, it's just one line, right? So we have one line two line, three line, 
just to comment one out, all we do is add slash slash in front of it. But if we wanted to comment all of them out, well, we could add slash slash in front of all of them, or we could add uh, slash asterisk, and that's going to comment everything out until it's told not to be commented. And you can tell because all this text is gray. I'm just going to actually uh, get rid of some of this so it fits on the screen again. And to end that comment, you use asterisk slash, which is the exact opposite of this, and to tell uh, if you've got an editor, any sort of IDE that's uh, using uh, syntax highlighting or any sort of coloring, color comes back. That's all it is. Now, one thing to note about writing any code in any programming language is use comments. Use a lot of comments. I would always say use more comments than not enough. Tell people what your function does. Why is a variable declared? What is it supposed to do? Is there a difference between one variable between a variable and, and an object? Or do you want to remind someone that one function has to run at a certain time? Or, you know, whatever you're doing, leave it in your comments. Now, if you're the only developer working on a project, really, is that necessary? For the most part, no, until your project gets bigger. Because when you're working on a, a large project, you might not touch some code for a week or two at a time. And when you come back, you might not remember where it is. Even if you think at the time you're going to remember all of this, chances are you won't. And you're going to come back and you have to figure out everything. Or you can just simply leave comments for yourself and you can read them when you come back to it. On the other side of the spectrum is if you're working with other developers, and this is very common, whether you're working on an open source project or you're a front end developer or a back end developer working in, uh, in a web development firm or on a team or in a startup, whatever it is you're doing, if you're working with other developers, leave comments so they understand what's going on and they should do the same for you. And if there are any developers that are writing code that are not leaving comments for you, in all honesty, they're not doing a very good job of communicating with you because developers don't pick up the phone and say, oh, hey, so I made this change because I would take forever. We would be on phone calls all day. Instead, we leave little comments saying, oh, yeah, I, I changed this or or this this one variable was was meant for something in particular. And it doesn't have to be extensive. So I, I put variable name. This is a declared variable, but there's nothing in there. That means technically it's defined, but the value is undefined. So this would be an empty string. This just means it's undefined. And in the comments, we could say why this is undefined. So this is just to set up a basic variable used in, I don't know, four other functions. Something like that. That's absolutely acceptable. If you're adding any level of clarity that another developer could benefit from, it is worth writing. Even if it takes you a little bit longer to write the same code just because you're adding comments, it is that important. Comments are easy. Comments are simple. Everybody knows how to do them. And they can exponentially increase your level of communication between you and your future self who's going to be looking back on past code that you're writing right now or you and your team and vice versa. Welcome developer. In this lesson we are going to learn about da -da -da, operators. Operators while really not the most interesting in the world uh, interesting subject in the world is how do I explain this? It's the most important, most fundamental thing, the most... Uh, I can't explain how important understanding operators is to programming. Because right now, all we've ever used uh, is a little bit of string manipulation. We've created some variables. Oh, and we've, we might have written a few comments. Uh, nothing extraordinary. Uh, to be honest, it's all actually quite boring. The fun stuff, it's getting so close. But before we can do any of that, we need to know what an operator is. So programming, while not strictly mathematical, is very, very logical. Um, and because of that, you cannot avoid not doing some math. Uh, you don't have to understand a lot of math to be a great programmer. That's the truth. Uh, in fact, a lot of programmers are actually quite terrible at math. Um, all they have to do is figure out the correct answer once, throw it into uh, some chunk of code, that gives them the, the correct answer every single time, and they never have to worry about it again. That is the beautiful thing about programming, is you don't have to be Einstein or Stephen Hawking or any sort of genius that has revolutionized the world. You can literally know very minimal math. And so some of the operators we're going to talk about today are super, super 
basic. Uh, we've got uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and we're going to get into a couple other ones. Uh, some of these are a little bit different. Uh, you may have not seen these. If you have been around programming a little bit, you might have seen some of these. Just remember to keep a little bit of an open mind here um, and try to be as logical as analytical as you can possibly be because if you can turn on that logical part of your brain this gets so much easier for you so first let's start with addition right if we do 12 plus 15 javascript gives us 27 basic math 12.5 plus 15.0123 gives us the exact answer we're looking for basic addition subtraction is absolutely no different and we can give this any number in the world that we want Right? We're going to give it some crazy numbers here. I just threw in random numbers. Let's look at this. Because this is such basic math, we just know that this is correct. This is not incorrect. So essentially, this is your calculator. But what if we said 15 divided by 5? Well, 5 goes into 15 three times. Basic math, right? I'm not here to teach, teach you math. I'm here to show you that this little operator sign is very important. What happens if we do... 15 divided by 6, 2.5, gives us a float. 15 divided by 14.9. Whoops, <laughs> did that wrong. 15, let's try division. Gives us a pretty accurate number. But what if we wanted to get the remainder of something? That's a little trickier. So programming comes with this uh, operator called modulus. And so if we said 15 modulus, uh, let's say 4, right? How many times does 4 go into 15? Well, 3 times, so 4, 8, 12. And what is the remainder? 3. Gives us exactly what we're looking for. If we said 97 modulus 42, 42 goes into 97 twice with a remainder of 13. That's modulus. That's pretty nice. Uh, are you going to use that often? Honestly, throughout my career as a front-end developer, I have not used it that often. I've actually used it more on the back side than I have on the front side. Uh, that's not to say that you won't ever use it, though. Okay, so I just cleared off the screen there. Um, let's create a variable. Age is equal to 67. Now, there are two more operators called uh, the incrementer and decrementer. And incrementer increases, as the root word suggests, your number. Age, plus plus, that's what an incrementer looks like. Uh, here we go. 8 plus plus, 68. What if we run it again? 69. What if we run it once more? 70. And it's going to keep going up by 1. If we said age is equal to 60.5 and run the, uh, the increment, it just keeps going up by 1. And if we wanted to do the inverse, we could decrease it by 1. Why is this important? Because in the future, we're going to be getting into loops. Uh, loops will run code in basically until it hits something that says stop. And for us, sometimes that means it hits a certain number and increases by one over and over or decreases by one over and over until it hits like zero or a specified number. Now, loops will do this for us automatically, but there is a reason that we want to do this manually. And it's because sometimes we're in a loop and we want to keep track of something else. How many objects are applicable when you loop through an array uh, of words like the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog? We split that into individual words and we loop through each word. If that word is um, dog or if that word is four letters or less, maybe increase a number by one over and over again. If that didn't make sense to you now, that's fine. Uh, we're going to be going over things like that in the future. It's not as complicated as I probably made it seem. Now let's look at assignment operators. Assignment operators are, uh, yeah, let's clean those off. And let's say num1 is equal to 10. Num2 uh, num is equal to 15. What if we said num1, uh, if we just wanted to add, I don't know, 25 to num1. We would say num1 is equal to num1 plus 25. Well, that's no use. When we could really just write num1 plus equals 25. Now the reason for that is because num1 was the number 10. We said plus is equal to 25. And if we type num1 again, 
it has assigned it. So not only did it do the addition for us, but it also said num1 is whatever the, the total is going to be here. Now we can do the same thing. We can say num1, but on the inverse and minus a number. So let's minus, uh, not 35, let's minus a bigger number. Let's minus 54. Num1 is now minus 19. And if we type the variable again, we know that num1 has been reassigned to be minus 19. Now you can do these assignment operators with uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulus. All you have to do is add the operator in front of the equal sign, and it automatically assigns the value of whatever it's going to be to that, to that variable for you. So now we have math on one line. So instead of saying, you know, num1 uh, is equal to uh, 10 plus 25 like we did before, what we're going to say is num1 is equal to plus equal to 25. Now we know num1 is currently minus 19. Do this again. And what we have is 6. Minus 19 plus 25 is 6. We type in num1, we have 6. So there's not really too much more we can go over with this, uh, but it really just makes your, it makes your math a little cleaner. And uh, really only do this for basic math. Don't, don't try doing this uh, for anything that's, you know, outside of your, your basic operators. If you have to do things in a certain order, uh, like bedness, uh, bed mass, brackets, exponents, division, multiplication, addition, subtraction, um, again, that kind of math you don't really need to remember right now, then, then do it uh, in line. Your math can also have parentheses in it. So if we did 12 plus 20 uh, divided by 2 minus 1 plus 4, I totally made that up hit enter, and we get whatever that answer was supposed to be, 19. But what this was doing is uh, the rule of Bedmas. Now in the next lesson, we're going to talk about comparison operators. Comparison operators, this is how programming is done. If something is true or false, really it comes down to quite Boolean things, or if one number is bigger than the other, take some sort of action. Those are comparison operators, we're going to get into those. That also comes with if else statements. As of right now, the only homework that I think you should, you should do call it a mini project or whatever you want, uh, is just open up your console here and just do some, some basic math. Just figure out how this works. You don't have to do anything super complicated, but try this, try the, uh, the addition operator, right? 12 plus 58. It threw me uh, an error because invalid left hand side in assignment. That means this is not uh, a variable, but if we said variable num is equal to 12 and we said, uh, 12 is 58, it gives us a number. So just play around with things like that. Feel free to get errors like this. And whenever you do get an error, Google it. Google is a great source of information. Stack Overflow has a ton of, of questions for you. Again, being a great developer is knowing when to Google things. If you get stuck, we have a, a giant Facebook group full of developers who are you know, at your position all the way up to the senior level who can definitely help you as well. All right, welcome back. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about comparison operators. Now, this is a fundamental concept between all programming languages. It really comes down to if something is true or false. And these are uh, binary options. Computers don't think in any sort of gray ground. It's, you know, it's either it's black or white. It's true, it's false. It's yes or no. And to get started, uh, we needed to know a lot up until this point. Now, this point is really how you give any sort of program the ability to think. If a variable comes out true, uh, do something. If it's false, do something else. Uh, that comes down to like an if-else operator, and, and we're going to get into that in the next lesson. But right now, we're just talking about comparison operators. Now, comparison operators, they're not very difficult. Uh, and really, the only math you need to know is if something is greater than, less than, or equal to. There's one other sort of caveat in there, and that's the one, does it equal to or does it not equal to? So instead of really trying to explain this, I think the best way to, to learn this is to just write it on the console. I'll talk as I go, and uh, if you have questions how, about how these work, feel free to ask them in the Facebook group. Yeah, so let's just get started with this. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do is one, 
is equal to 1. This comes out true because 1 is always 1. But what happens if I said 1 is equal to 2? It says false. Now the reason that this is comparing and not assigning a variable is because there are two equal signs. If we said 1 is equal to 1, JavaScript is going to think, oh, well, I'm going to assign the variable named 1, the value of 1, and what happens? Nothing, because your variables cannot start with a number. Now, what if we used floats instead of integers? We said 1.0 is equal to 1.0. That's true. What about 1.0 is equal to 1? That's also true. All right, so I just cleared the console there. And uh, so that's basic integers, right? Uh, 1 is equal to 10. We know that 1 does not equal 10. Only 10 can ever be 10. So this turns out to be false. But what if we started comparing strings together? What if we said test is equal to test? Well, this is the exact same thing comparing essentially against itself. So this has to be true. But what if we said test is equal to something else? Now we're comparing two strings together. So the data type is the same. However, the values are different. So test does not equal something else. Just because the data type is the same does not mean that this is necessarily true. And when we hit enter, we see that this is in fact false. So what happens if we start putting some of these into variables? So let's put variable name is equal to Caleb. That's just my name. Now we wanted to say name is equal to equal to. This is comparing it. So this is not going to compare this name. It's going to compare Caleb. Remember, capital K because JavaScript is case sensitive. So if we said Caleb is equal to, let's spell my name, technically the proper name, what happens? It's false. But if we said Caleb is equal to equal to, we're comparing it, Caleb with capital K, it's true because it's the exact same now. Now if we do a strict comparison, that's three equal signs, and we put the exact same comparison as above, but only with with one additional equal sign, it's still true. Now the reason for that is because this value right here is literally the exact same. So it's not comparing just the value, it's also comparing the data type. Now what if we said age is equal to 45, and then we compared age is equal to equal to 45. That's true. What if age is equal to equal to equal to 45. Also true. What if age is equal to equal to equal to 45.0? Also true. JavaScript realizes that 45 is the same as 45.0. Or what if we did the inverse? 45.0 is equal to equal to equal to age. Also true. So it doesn't matter what side the equal to comparison uh, the variable lives on, as long as it's being compared. That's all it cares about. Now, there are other comparisons that we need to really consider here. I'm just going to clear off the console here. And what if we said age is greater to, greater to or equal than 45? Also true. Age is greater than 45. That's false. Age is 45. It is not greater than. It is greater than or equal to. Before we continue, let's take a look at some of the different operators that we have. We have equals, a strict equals, it does not equal, a strict does not equal. We have greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, and then when we, when we want to mix and match comparisons, we have, this is and, so instead of writing the word and, we use two, two ampersands, or when we want to say if something is true or something else is true, we use two pipe symbols, and this stands for or. Now let's declare uh, again, let's redeclare age is equal to 20. And uh, if you live in the United States, the drinking age is 21. So drinking age is equal to 21. So now we can say, essentially, if the age is greater than or equal to the drinking age, then you can go out and buy a beer. But we would compare that by if the age, not 20, but age is equal to or greater than the drinking age, then we can execute some code. Now, this always has to turn out true. In this case, it didn't. It turned out false because age is less than the drinking age. If we did the inverse, we wrote age is less than or equal to drinking age. 
we get true. What if we just did age is less than drinking age? Also true. But what happens when we start comparing variables to other variables that do not exist? So what if we said age is equal to equal to something else? So as you see, we get something else is not defined. But what if we said age is equal to, and we know the other data type is undefined? Well, that's false because age is in fact defined. But what if we said something else is equal to undefined? Well, again, JavaScript gives us a reference area and says that something else is not defined. And to do a strict comparison gives us the exact same thing. So why should we ever use a strict comparison? Well, let's take a look at age. Age is 20. What if we did age is equal to, as a string, 20? That's true. What if we said age is equal to 21? That's false. So JavaScript realizes that this 20 is the same as an integer, which is technically not right because this is not supposed to be a number. This is considered to be a string. This is where we start using strict operators. What if we said age is equal to equal to equal to 20? We get false. So while it's true here with a loose comparison, it's false here with a strict comparison. Now, why would you ever use that? Well, because sometimes the user is going to input information and when they input it like a, a number or text, it always comes back as a string. So if the user's age input happened to be 20 and we want to compare it to be at least 21 or higher, we would we could do a loose uh, a loose comparison greater than or equal to 21, false, or if it had to be an exact age, for example, someone winning the lottery could only ever be the age 20, has to be exactly 20, we could do it this way, or we could do it with a strict operator like this. That comes out true as well. Okay, so now on the inverse, we can do does not equal to, right? So we still have age is 20. What if we said age does not equal 20? That's false because age is in fact 20. But if we said age does not equal any other number, anything that's not the number 20, this will turn out to be true. So we could say age does not equal literally anything. Oh, can't have those in there. Now we can do a strict comparison as well. What happens if we said age does not equal to undefined? Well, that's true because age has been defined. That means age has an, a technical value of 20. What if we said uh, something else does not equal to undefined? We still get the same is not defined error. Now, what if we created another variable, but one of those blank ones that we've seen just a little bit of? Let's call this variable empty comes back as an undefined because variable hoisting, we type in empty, we get undefined. So what if we said empty is equal to undefined? Well, that's true. Empty is equal to strict undefined, also true. But what if we said empty does not equal undefined? That one's false. So it's the exact opposite of what you see up here because empty, which was declared as a variable, does not have any sort of information associated to it, is in fact undefined. We know that using the not equals or the strict not equals comparison, that empty is in fact false. So what I would like you to do, just for a little bit of practice, open up your console and start writing some variables and just compare them together. It doesn't really matter what it is, uh, I want you to get a feel for how these work versus whether it's right or wrong. Right or wrong can come a little bit later. I just want you to understand how these work. The comparisons that you have access to. You have equals, a strict equals, greater than or equal to, greater than. You have less than or equal to. You have less than, you have does not equals, and does not equal strict. So go ahead, give these a shot. And when you're done that, we'll see you in the next lesson. Hello.
In this lesson, we're going to be talking about if-else statements. Now, we've done a lot of flirting with what if-else statements are. We've learned about comparisons and variables, and we really have all the ingredients that we need in order to understand what an if-else statement is. Now, the simplest way to describe what an if-else statement is, is really just that. If something is true, or if you want it to be false, then run a certain set of code. You know, a few lines here, a few lines there. Uh, if it's not that, if it's the opposite, do something else. Again, this is one of those fundamental concepts of all programming languages. They all have if-else statements. This is how a program decides what it's supposed to do versus what it should not do, uh, and when it's supposed to take any sort of action. And this is when things start to get really, really interesting because users can start to input their own information. And once they input their own information, you can start, you know, changing the actions based on what they've added. So as a very basic example, let's get started with our first variable. Let's say variable name is equal to Caleb, right? Just my name. We know what this is all about. Not exciting. Caleb, get to it. All right, I'm getting to it. So if... And the, parent, uh, the parentheses for an if-else statement is really everything goes in here. This is where your comparison is. So your comparison, I did not spell that right, comparison goes in here. So if name is equal to Caleb, which we know it is, what should it run? So when we open a new if statement, we wrap the new code that's supposed to run in curly brackets, just like you see here. So what happened there was I hit enter a little too fast. I was supposed to hit shift enter. That's all that was. Now, if my name is Caleb, alert, name is Caleb. We haven't formally learned alert yet. If it's not, my name is not Caleb. So this is not formatted very nicely. Typically, you'll see code with a little nicer spacing, something like this. So now we have, if a name is equal to whatever you specify that name is supposed to be, remember, it's case sensitive, then run the code between the curly brackets. Now in here, it's going to run just a basic alert. Now, if the name does not equal Caleb, which remember, does not is the exclamation mark equal sign. So if the name does not equal Caleb, alert something else. So what happens when I run this? My name is Caleb. That's the alert that Chrome just gave me. So now we're starting to get a little more into interactivity because this just alerted me on the page. Now, there's nothing you can do about, uh, about an alert. When you alert someone, that shows up every single time. And that's a basic if-else statement. That's all there is to it. Now, if you want to chain these together, you can do what's called an else if. So we have if, else if, and else. So as a quick example, if name is name is equal to pick any name you want. Doesn't it doesn't have to be your variable. It should actually be something else. So I'm just gonna say if my name is Joseph. Alert. Hello, Joe. else if name is equal to and that should actually be space in there else if name is equal to Caleb we know that this one's true so this is going to run uh, this is true now we could just leave it here if we wanted to uh, there's no rule saying that you have to have an else statement or uh, an if else statement Really, you just need if statements. If something is true or if something is not true, execute a certain piece of code. That's all it is. But for the sake of this example, so now to run through this quickly, if the name is Joseph, alert hello Joe. If the name is not Joseph, check to see if that name is Caleb. We know that's true, that's going to run. Uh, but if the name does not match Joseph or Caleb, then it's going to alert something else. So based on what we know so far, uh, just take a quick second, pause the video here if you have to, uh, and think to yourself, which one is supposed to run? Or if you switch the order of these, which one is going to run? And 
if Joseph or Caleb is true, and one of the first two if statements is successfully run, the code inside of it starts running, does the code inside of the else statement also run? Well, let's find out. It says this is true because the name is Caleb. And that's it. So it didn't run because Joseph, the name is not Joseph. It ran because the name is Caleb and it did not run the else statement. So what an if else if else block really does is it checks for a certain true comparison. So when your comparison is true, it's just going to run that code and it's not going to run any of the other blocks that you write with it. In the next lesson, I'm going to show you how to prompt for some information. And then we're going to do an if else statement based on what the user inputs. And we're going to show you that user input can actually change how a program acts. But for now, uh, take a quick second, open up your console uh, and, and create a, an if else if else statement for yourself uh, and just play around with it. Make sure it works. Uh, the lesson here is not about alerts, although if you wanted to throw that in there, no harm done. All right, in the last lesson, we learned how to do an if, else if, and else statement. Uh, but now I want to show you how we can take some user input uh, and really customize what the program is supposed to do. And for this, we need to learn something new, something called prompt. In the last lesson, we learned about alert a little bit, a little informally, I suppose. Uh, but in this one, we're going to learn about the prompt, which is basically an alert with a little text box that allows people to enter information. Now. Just as a heads up, nobody uses prompts anymore, but because prompts are nice and simple, uh, we are going to use them in this lesson just to show you how we can use user input uh, to change how the program acts. So let's go ahead and type name is equal to prompt. What is your name? Now here I hit shift enter because if I just hit enter, it's just going to give me a prompt and it's not going to do anything else. Now, this is where we start putting a lot of JavaScript inside of a JavaScript file so we can run more than one line at a time. Now, if I said if name, actually let's do this, if name to lowercase is equal to Caleb, just my name, nothing fancy, alert, hello Caleb. Now that's a basic if statement. We can leave that here. In fact, I think we should run that. Let's see what happens. What's your name? And I'm going to put, well, it's asking for Caleb in lowercase. So let's change that. Let's put it all in uppercase. Minus the B. The B can be in lowercase. Because remember, user input is never the way you expect. So you have to do a little extra filtering to make sure that the user input is parsable. And there we go. It says, hello, Caleb. The reason for that is because it took my name, uh, which was K-A-L-O, all in caps with a lowercase b. It changed it to a lowercase, and then it said, if that lowercase value of the name variable is equal to lowercase Caleb, then alert. So what I have here is just a blank index file. There's no JavaScript being attached to this page at all. The first thing we need to do is attach the JavaScript file. So at the bottom of my body, I'm going to type script, src is equal to javascript.js. Now the javascript.js is your JavaScript file. Now I have a javascript.js file, and it's in the same directory as index.html. It's in the same folder. So this is all we have to do. Now to make sure that this is working, let's go over to javascript.js and type alert, hello world. All we want to do is make sure that this script is working. I save that, save both files. I go over to Chrome and I refresh the page and it says, hello world. That means our JavaScript file is working. Now there are other ways to check it. Uh, this is one of the faster ways to check to see if your JavaScript is, is loading. You don't have to open your console or anything. It's just a, a blatant alert in your face. It's ugly, but it does the trick. So now we want to rewrite our script. Let's say name, let's do variable name is equal to what is your name? And we want to wrap that with a prompt. And we say if name alert hello. And we know how to concatenate, right? So we use hello concatenate variable name. And hello guest. So what this is doing 
is if someone enters a name, if there is information in here, it's going to return true. JavaScript is going to say, yep, there's something in there that is true. It is not undefined. It is not null. It is not false. That this data type from this value is in fact true. It has some information in there. And if there is, just give us an alert back, say hello, and whatever that value is. But if there isn't anything in there, if someone clicks the cancel button, what happens? Well, hello guest. Now this is called information flow or data flow. And this is also a very important concept. Uh, pretty much of all programming languages, again, is what happens if something does not meet your expectation? What if someone cancels in the prompt? So let's save this. Go back to this page. I'm going to hit refresh. And it asks me what my name is. Now there are only ever two scenarios. I can enter my name and hit OK, or I can cancel. So what happens when I put my name in or anyone's name in? It doesn't have to be my name. Uh, let's put someone else's name in there. Let's put my name is Zephyr and I hit OK. Hello, Zephyr. Cool. That's user input. Now I refresh the page again to get that prompt running again. What is my name? And if I hit cancel this time, what's going to happen? Well, if we look back at our code, if there's a name, it's going to say hello plus your name. If there is nothing, it's just going to say hello guest. And in fact, it actually didn't. And that's because I forgot to take into account the null data type. And that's something that just happens with all programmers every now and then. Uh, we move a little too fast. A lesson as a developer, making mistakes is okay. You're allowed to make mistakes as a developer. I'm giving you permission to make mistakes right now. Completely acceptable. It only becomes unacceptable when you start making the same mistake over and over and over and over again. So looking back at the code, we know that the value of name is null. Null came back as a true value. That's why it ran in here. So what we need to do is instead of running an else statement, we run an if else statement. Sorry, we run an else if statement. Else if name is equal to, let's do an exact comparison and see how that pans out. Alert, your name is empty. Save that, go back to the page and refresh. My name is, let's cancel. Again, it says hello, no. Well, why is that? Well, it's because the if statement came before the else if statement. And so once this is true, it's going to ignore the rest of the, the, the entire statement. Uh, the chain of command goes from top to bottom. And once one of those is met, it doesn't matter what else you have in there. It's not going to include it. It's not going to run it. So what we need to do is we need to change the order of this here. So I'm just going to move this up one, move this down one. And so all I did was say, check if the name is null first. Now we're using a strict comparison here. Let's see what happens. What's my name? I hit cancel. Again, it says, hello, no. Why is it doing that? Could it be because we have var up there? Could it be because we're using a strict comparison? Could it be because null is supposed to be in quotes or apostrophes? Could be. Now, as a developer, this is one of those times when you need to understand that knowing everything is impossible. You don't have to remember things like this all the time. This is a small detail. And if you ever forget, it's totally acceptable to hop on the old Google machine and type in whatever your question or your query is, chances are it'll bring you to a Stack Overflow page and you'll find probably a pretty good answer in there. Now, I'm going to change this to null to remove the strict comparison. And I just want to see what this is going to happen, right? We're experimenting here. And again, experimenting as a developer, completely acceptable because that's how you learn. You experiment, you make mistakes, and you reiterate over that. And you just keep iterating. And when you iterate, you learn more and more. And that's all development is. That's really all technology is, is people trying new things and moving forward, failing, taking a step back, realizing why they failed and trying again. That's all it is. We still get null. That's fine. What happens if we remove var? We still get null. Now, another option that we have is to check to see if this is a string or not. Now, do you remember a few lessons ago, quite a few lessons ago, 
I said that user input always comes in as a string. For the most part, that holds true across every platform for every website and application. And that's just because we don't know if a number is, or if a user input is supposed to be a number or text, and that's our job as developer to figure out what it is. So all I'm going to do is add quotations around here. So now it's going to say, if the name is null as a string, like this is what it brought back. This is what it thinks your name currently is. Not that there's nothing in there, not that anything else, not that this is a number or a float, it just thinks that this is your name. So it would be a string. Save that, refresh the page, click cancel, and I guarantee you that this time it's going to work. Your name is empty, just like that. So now we know what happens when your name is empty. Now, as a learning lesson, go back, figure out what happened. Hit refresh, hit cancel. My name is still empty, so we know that it wasn't the var. What if we do a strict comparison? Same thing. So we know with the strict comparison that this is returning null. Now, another way we can check this is this beautiful, beautiful method here. Console log will log anything to your console. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just inspect, refresh the page, hit cancel. It says my name is empty. Go over to console, and this is what it came back with. So now we know what the answer is. Now we don't have to do a lot of this additional testing. We can do a console log right here. We can do a console log in here. We can do one in here. We can do one in here to see where the information is going. And it gives you a better visual idea of where your data is flowing to. Now, what happens when I put my name is Caleb, hit enter. Hello, Caleb. Caleb comes in here, just as expected, just like what null uh, what the null response gave us, but instead of null, it's Caleb. As a developer, as a programmer, it's also your job to look for efficiencies. So we look at this if else if else statement. We know that there can only ever be two different types of input, right? We know that there can only be a cancel and an okay. So you submit your name or you cancel, that's it. What we have here is if your name is empty, if you didn't add a name, alert that your name is empty. Otherwise, basically in every other situation, just alert the name. So why on earth do we have the else statement in there at all? If there are only ever two scenarios, we only ever need two if else statements. We don't need to check what the name is in the else statement because frankly, the name is always going to be reiterated back into the alert message. Now, if we wanted to make sure that the name was something very, very specific, then we would say if uh, else if name is equal to something else. And only in that time will this display. So let's try. Let's try another name. What this is doing, if you have no name, if you've canceled, your name is empty. If the name is Henry, alert Henry. Otherwise, if it doesn't meet either of these criteria, do nothing. And this is the exact same as leaving a blank else statement in there. The only difference is you don't need to have the else statement in there if nothing is going to run. So let's get rid of that, save it. Type in Henry. Hello, Henry. But as an example, when we type in any other name, we'll type in Prairie, nothing happens. We're, we're still getting the name, we're getting the console log. And that always comes right here. But there was no alert. So that is pretty much the most in depth if, else if, else statement based on user input uh, that anyone can really give you. Moving forward, the if and else if statements really don't get too complicated. But in the meantime, what I want you to do is I want you to basically take this script. If you can, 
I would prefer if you wrote this out. It's not a long script, so it's not going to take you very long. But writing it gives you a little bit of muscle memory in your fingers, so writing it becomes a little bit easier in the future. Alrighty, uh, so that's it for if, else if, and else statements, and we will see you in the next lesson. Hello, welcome back. I was originally going to go over a few more fundamental concepts of uh, programming in JavaScript, but to be honest, it's getting a little bit dry and I think we need something a little more exciting, something a little more interactive, something that really demonstrates why JavaScript is so popular and why it is a good programming language. Now to do that, I think we need to create a little bit of interactivity in the page. So now we're going to edit a little bit of HTML. Uh, this course is not based on HTML or CSS, so the styling that you see, the basic HTML, is very raw. We're not here to make a beautiful website. I'm sure you know HTML and CSS, and you can make these as beautiful as you want. But for the purpose of this lesson, we're going to keep things simple. So what we're going to learn today are query selectors. How do we get information, or how do we add information to the page? So we have two parts to this lesson that I would like to go over. The first one is how do we add information into the page? And the second one is how do we grab information from the page? Now a query selector requires either a class, an ID, or an element. Now there are ways to make this a lot more complicated, but we're gonna stick with the basics right now. And at this point in time, you should be familiar with IDs and classes and HTML and CSS. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just gonna write a basic class. Uh, actually, let's do an ID. I'm gonna call this main. So I have a div called main with the ID of main in there. That ID is very important. And I'm gonna leave this blank. There's not going to be anything in there. Now I'll go over to my browser and I'm just gonna open up the console. And what we see here inside of the, the element section, if I toggle down the body, we can see that main is in there. In case you didn't know, you can actually edit information in here. So. I'm just going to make this a, a little easier uh, for you to see here. So I added the word tested and it added it onto my page immediately. I'm going to add a little bit more. It says and more. So it doesn't take into account your extra white space because that's what HTML does. HTML doesn't care about your extra white space unless you explicitly tell it that it needs to have more white space. So I'm going to undo this. I'm going to go over to my console and I'm going to create a variable. And this variable is just going to be called body. In fact, we don't actually need the var. And all we want to do is write document dot query selector. Now, the reason we use document dot is because query selector is a method, a function that is a part of the page document. So we type query selector, and what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for the ID of main. So we wrap this in a string with parentheses around it because it's, it's a function. And just like you're targeting in CSS, you target the same way using query selectors. So here we type main, hit enter, and it gives us our HTML. We can see it in there. So we know that it's selected the right thing. In fact, actually what I'm going to do because I don't want to uh, create too many variables with different names. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear this. There we go. We have main is equal to main. I just want to make sure that main is equal to main. This way nobody's getting confused about uh, the body element. Main, if we wanted to add any information into this element, we add inner HTML. And when we start typing the word dot inner, we get inner dot HTML. Parentheses and then open a string and say, hello world. Now, how come this didn't work? We used parentheses, we used a string, just like we did in the query selector, but it gave us a problem. It said HTML is not a function. Now, when you see something like that, it's because it literally is not a function. There's nothing to run. Instead, what you want to do is you want to change the actual value, the inner HTML is what is held inside of an element. That's what JavaScript sees it as. It sees it as a property, not a function, but like an attribute, just like how you might have dark hair or blue eyes, or you might be wearing a green shirt. It's a property of who, who you are or what you're wearing. 
and that's what we're going to edit. So instead of trying to change the fundamental properties of a person to get them to change their shirt color, we're just going to change the shirt color because it doesn't need to be that complicated. So here we type main.innerHTML is equal to hello world. And we see that it shows up automatically. So now we're getting a lot more interactive. Our JavaScript is actually able to go in and edit things that are on the page as long as it knows what to look for. And in this case, it's looking for the ID of main, which we know is in here. Now, if we look at the element, it actually added hello world for us. So if we wanted to, we could go in here, we could edit this. Hello world 2222 shows up in there console. We could run the same thing again, and it's just going to override it just like that. Now, if we wanted to add more, we could use an arithmetic operator. We say main dot inner HTML is equal to whatever it currently is plus hello world. So instead of adding hello world, we're going to add uh, another line in here that just says, I am editing this page. And now we look up here and it says, hello world, I am editing this page. Now we have both sentences in there. But what if we wanted to get the information from there and store that in a variable, edit it, and put it back on the page? Well, we can do that too. Let's create a new variable called content. The variable name is unimportant. You can call it whatever you like. Say main.innerHTML. And now every time we write content, we get the current content. So what happens now that we've created the content variable that has hello world, I'm editing this page as a string. What happens if we edit the inner HTML again? Does content change? Well, let's find out. Main.innerHTML. Well, we know that's the same. Let's go ahead and change that. And we added the word edited. Now what happens when we type content again? Nothing. Content was stored the way that we originally grabbed the information. So just because you stored information in one of the variables from the inner HTML does not mean that you cannot go and change that inner HTML again and have your content change. This is a very, very good thing. So now we have the original content. We don't have the word edited in there. That's perfect. That's exactly what we want. But now we want to edit content and throw it back into the page. We want to edit the page based on what, what it used to be. So just as a demonstration, we're going to change the inner HTML to please remove me. We know that content is still what it originally was. So now let's edit content. Content is equal to, well, what do we want to do with it? We could change it to uppercase. So let's do content dot to uppercase. Now, a beautiful thing in JavaScript is this ability to string methods together. So we could say to uppercase. And then we could also say dot replace bases with dashes. And what happens when we hit enter? It did exactly what we wanted. Uh, so it turned everything to uppercase. Uh, we replaced our first space with a dash. And that's because we didn't tell it to replace all the all the spaces. We just told it to replace the first one of its kind. So now if we type main dot inner HTML is equal to content we have changed the content of the page. However, while doing this, we overwrote the original content variable and it is no longer what it used to be. We can no longer get that back. We're going to do another example and we're going to create an input. We're going to use a class selector instead and we're just going to call this text field. So we've got an input, type is text, class is text field. And inside of this text field, we're going to assume that someone has entered some sort of information in here, some info in here. We go back to our page and refresh. We have a basic input field. It just says some info in here. Now, how do we get that information? It's not the same as how we did it with main. Let's try that. Let's do txt is equal to document.querySelector. What is the selector that we're looking for? Dot text field, dot being the class, just like in CSS. Cool, that gives us the entire element. Now we have the entire element to modify here. 
what happens if we do txt dot inner html is equal to test well it returned test it didn't look like it changed anything in there well okay it changed the inner html of input however input is one of those elements that doesn't have inner html it's a self-closing tag there's only one it's not it's not like a div or a text field or a text area rather the input field generally just looks like this that's your input field so how do we view the input that we wanted to change like how, how do we see that on the page the trick here is that we are no longer editing inner html we're editing an attribute we want to change the value we want to change the value attribute so instead we type txt and then the attribute name is equal to a new attribute value and now we can see that the value of the text field has changed as well now if we wanted to get that information create a new variable call it input is equal to txt dot value and if i alert the input it gives us exactly what's on the page but what if i changed it dynamically on the page what if i'm a user i'm not looking at the code right as a user i just want to interact with the page normally so i'm going to say hello my name is lamp and i wanted to get this information again well i know i want to alert it and i know that i need to get this information again so what happens if i do txt dot value we get the value of the input field now that's perfect but that might be a little bit confusing how come it worked here but it didn't work in the previous example when we were changing the inner html well, that's not to say that it didn't actually work uh, it worked the way that we wanted it to however there's a little bit of difference because we're working with a value so what we're doing here is we're grabbing the txt variable from up here and we know that this is selecting this input this whole element now the variable has not stored the value of this element yet this variable is simply referring to the entire element so anytime that the value changes we can go ahead and get the new value because we didn't store that in a variable now if we did data is equal to txt dot value we get hello my name is lamp if we change uh, txt dot value is equal to something else and type data again it's back to where it was so it basically takes a snapshot of where the data was what it was uh, and stores it in a variable for you i'm just going to comment this out in html so it doesn't show up and i'm going to go back to main and i'm going to change some of these style attributes because in javascript a very common thing that you want to do is add classes remove styling add styling you know you want to basically manipulate your css because css is extremely static you want to change that from time to time refresh the page i have absolutely nothing there i look in my elements i know that main is there my input is also there but it's, it's commented out so we're not going to work with that but the main say main is equal to document dot query selector cool it selected the right one now if i want to change the inner html perfect now we have some text on the page and if I want to change the style, we say main.style.border. And because this is an object oriented a dot notation kind of language, it looks for the style and then it looks for the specific CSS style. Border is as a string, one pixel solid red. And now we have a one pixel solid red border around it. One thing you can't do though is if you wanted to add border to just the top you don't add dashes instead you camel case it and it would be border and instead of the dash you use a capital t that's actually a bad example because we already have a border let's use something else main.style dot padding top is equal to let's make this absurd and say 50 pixels now that padding only took place on the top and what happens in our page is where it says style we're changing the style attribute now we didn't give it a style attribute in the html but javascript is smart enough to realize that oh okay this can have a style pretty much everything in html can have a style so it goes ahead it creates the attribute for us and it fills it with the information that we gave it 
we gave it a style of uh, one pixel solid red border with a 50 pixel padding on the top. Now, if you're unfamiliar with uh, how to edit CSS, uh, just a quick little reminder is when you're on your elements page, you can toggle these as well. And if you don't like what you're seeing, you can always edit the HTML directly. Okay, so that's query selector in a nutshell. What I want you to do is I want you to create an element on your HTML page. I'll give you the project files as well. Create an element on your HTML page and then open up your console and write a query selector. Grab that, put it in a variable like you saw with main is equal to document.querySelector. Then I want you to change the inner HTML, and then I want you to change the styling of it. And it doesn't just have to be the border or the padding. Try other CSS properties that you're aware of. It could be margin, background color. It could be the font color. And then I want you to basically do the same thing, but instead of using an ID selector or a class selector, just use an element selector. See what happens when you select the entire body and you change the background color of the body. Hello again. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about functions. Now, functions are, uh, again, a very important part of programming. Uh, it's in every programming language. And essentially what a function is, is a set amount of code that you can run over and over and over without having to copy and paste it over and over again. This falls in line with DRY, which uh, is, is the dry methodology of don't repeat yourself. So whenever you're writing code, try not to repeat the exact same code over and over again. If you ever have to repeat the same code, it should go into a function. But a function can also take parameters or arguments. And basically what it does is you input information and it spits out a little bit of information. So let's take a look at a quick sample function. A sample function always starts with the word function, and that's how JavaScript knows exactly what this is. And then you give it a name, and you can name it pretty much anything. Uh, stick with the same naming conventions as uh, variables. Don't start with a number. Don't use dashes. Basically, anything else goes. So for this one, we're going to call it addition, and we're just going to add two numbers together. That's all we're going to do. So this looks a lot like an if-else statement, where we have the uh, the parentheses, and then we have our curly brackets, and anything inside the curly brackets is part of the function. When we want to add numbers together, we can run this function over and over again. So whatever is in here is going to be able to run time and time again. Now, just because you have written a function does not mean it's going to run. It's registered in part of your application, but you actually need to give it a, you need to give JavaScript a command. You have to tell it, oh, go and run that particular function. So to do that, you just write the function name without the word function in front of it, give it the parentheses that it needs, and that tells JavaScript just with these parentheses that it's a function and it will run it. So let's give this a shot here. Alert. Hello, I am a function. Now, when I open this page and I refresh it, uh, this this HTML here, by the way, is just from the previous lesson. Uh, we're just going to keep adding on to this, uh, this HTML as the lesson goes on and on and on. Uh, anyway, so I refresh the page and it says, hello, I'm a function. I refresh the page. Hello, I'm a function. But if I comment this code out and I refresh the page again, nothing happens. I'm refreshing over and over and over and nothing is happening. That's because JavaScript knows that the function exists, but it also knows not to run it yet until it's told to do so. Now, this function as of right now is not very useful. Now, what if we wanted to run a certain set of code that just asks for somebody's name, just like in, in previous examples that we've done? Well, we can create variables inside of a function, say name is equal to, and let's prompt, what is your name? So all this is going to do is ask what your name is and say hello name. We've seen this before, but the difference is this time it's in a function. So I save, refresh. It says, what is your name? I'm going to put my name in there. Hello, Caleb. 
nothing fancy, nothing we don't know about yet. The only difference is that we are essentially running this from one command. And if we wanted to run this over and over and over again, we could put this in other bits of code. We could say, if today is equal to, you know, Wednesday, you'd have to assign today to be whatever uh, the day actually is. In this case, it would just be WED, then addition, else addition. So now we're not writing these two lines of code in here twice, we're using just this one line twice. And so it creates this reference back to what the original set of code is supposed to do. And now you're not repeating yourself. There's no point typing the same thing over and over again if you can type it once and have it run the exact same way every single time. Now carry on with this, with this example. Let's actually do some addition here. So let's do num1 is equal to 15. Num, uh, num2 is equal to, I don't know, 89. And alert num1 plus num2. Uh, and then let's get rid of this stuff. Save it. Refresh the page. Gives me 104. That's because it added 15 with 89 and just return that. Now, a function should not alert something in it. Uh, alert is generally actually just a bad practice. Uh, it's good for debugging, but really alerts are, it's an old school JavaScript thing that most developers don't use anymore. So let's say we wanted to put these two numbers, 15 and 89 added together into a variable. Well, how do we get the total, the 104 number that we saw into a variable outside of the function? Because we can do total is equal to num1 plus num2, Awesome. What do we do with that? Well, let's try running this function and then let's see what happens when we run alert total. Refresh the page, I get 104. Cool. What happens if I move this above the addition? Nothing is happening. I'm refreshing, nothing is happening. Why is that? Well, if I open up my console, we have an error here. Total is not defined. Now, why is that? That's because JavaScript does not know that this exists. Even though total is right here, as of this point in time, it has not been declared. So again, JavaScript is aware of this function. It does not know the contents of it until it's run. So if we move this down, save, refresh the page, it gives us the number that we're looking for. But now what happens if we, uh, let's keep that there, add var in front of it, refresh the page, total is not defined. Even though it was defined a moment ago, it no longer is defined. Now, why is that? That's because var declares a variable inside of a scope. Now, scope is this concept that variables can only exist inside of certain areas. So if you have a, a function, any function with var, and then you have a variable, it can only ever be accessed inside of that function. So you might be thinking at this time, well, why the heck would I ever want that? Why wouldn't I want total to be accessible outside of this function after I run it? And that is a fair question. And the honest answer is, you don't want variables bleeding out of their scopes. Sometimes it's for security purposes, sometimes it's for efficiency, sometimes it's just to keep your code clean, but you do not want to use these outside of your functions. So if we're not supposed to use it this way, how the heck are we supposed to get total outside of the function? Well, this is where the beautiful return keyword comes in. We return total. So total has been declared here. It's the addition of num1 plus num2. We return that total. And if we run this on our page, we still get total is not defined. Now, why is that? Because what return does is it says, okay, I'm going to run this function and I'm going to return this as the definition of a variable. So if we have, and we've done this many times, uh, so if we did variable name is equal to John, we know that this is the value of the variable called John. But instead, what we can do is we can say, uh, let's actually just delete this whole thing. Let's go uh, variable total, or let's call it new total instead is equal to addition. 
So instead of saying this is 104 as a string or an integer, or instead of saying uh, 15 plus 89, all we're saying is store whatever this function figures out the total to be in this variable. So now if we said alert new total, this will give us 104. So go back to the page, refresh, 104 as we expected. Now inside of your function, you can run all the JavaScript in the world. Ideally, it should never leak outside of your function, though your function should be a contained specific set of instructions that you can use over and over again. But let's say we want to customize this. We want to customize num1 and num2. Well, every time we run this function, it's always going to be 15 and 89, respectively. That's not what we want. Functions are typically used best when they are extremely dynamic. And the only thing we want to do is we want to automate num1 plus num2. So instead of saying num1 and num2 are always the exact same numbers, instead we give them parameters or arguments. And all we do is we create a new variable inside of the parentheses separated by a comma and another new variable. Now this is the name. As you can see here, num2, num2, num1 matches num1. So let's go ahead and delete these because as soon as this function is run, it's going to create this variable inside of the function and it's only accessible inside of this function. So if we did different numbers this time, 10 and 15, we're saying run addition, the first number should be 10 and the second number should be 15. The function is then going to take num1, which is 10, num2, which is 15, total them together, return that into a new variable for us. And when we alert that new variable, we're going to get whatever the total is going to be. So I'm going to save that, refresh, and as soon as I refresh, this is going to alert with a number 25. Just like that. Now, why is that useful? Well, you can create a calculator. Well, I mean, it's a pretty basic calculator, but you can create a calculator that only has the addition function right now. But what if we wanted to add more? What if we wanted to do different addition? So instead of having to run uh, total is equal to num1 plus num2, or having to explicitly hard code numbers into our program or our application, we can now say any other number in the world. And what I'm going to do is instead of uh, alerting, I'm going to console log. So console log new total comma new total two. Save that. And I'm going to refresh the page and instead of the answer being alerted to the page, it's going to show up in the console. So I hit F5, and there we have 25 and 1,114. Now that's the addition of these two numbers and these two numbers. So now we have one function that's doing the same thing over and over again. Completely honest with you. This, this course is not about sugarcoating things as you may have experienced already. But this function is, honestly, it's nonsense. There's no reason that this function should really exist. But if you wanted to, you could make this function significantly more complex. You could take num1, you could multiply it by pi. You could take num2 and you could divide it by whatever itself is. You could take num2 and you could square root it by whatever number you want. Now you don't have to remember that formula anymore. Or if you have a specific math formula, right, so it's gonna take num1 times basically pi, and then it's going to add num2 divided by 8. I cannot do that in my head. So I'm going to save that, and what happens when I refresh the page? It gives me a very accurate number. So now it's doing basic math for us, and by basic, I mean multiplication, addition, and division is still basic, but I've only ever written this formula once. I never have to remember it again. The only thing I should do is add comments around this function as to what exactly it's doing. So what I would like you to do for this lesson is I want you to create a new function. It does not have to be addition. It could be called whatever you like. You can have as many parameters as you like. It could be one parameter. It could be 30 parameters, although preferably don't do that. Maybe stick to a limit of like four parameters at max, just because it gets to be a lot to remember. Whatever you do inside of your function, and I don't really care what you do inside of your function, as long as you save it as a variable inside your function and return it. Or alternatively, you could take this 
and it's going to return the exact same number for you without storing it in a variable. I just did this for clarity. But I want you to return whatever it is your function is supposed to return and then throw it into two new variables and console log those out, just like I did with this video. In the next lesson, we're going to create a couple other functions just as a demonstration because functions are so incredibly important. Uh, I want to make sure that this is really drilled into your brain because, again, this is something that you can take from JavaScript to every other programming language in the world. So go ahead, do that task real quick, and then uh, we'll do a couple of examples, a couple more examples of functions in the next video. In this lesson, I just want to go over a few more examples of what you can do in a function. And that's really not limited to anything. You can do any JavaScript inside of a function. But functions are something that you're going to be working with every single day. And I want to make sure that you really understand what it is. So if you don't have a full grasp of what functions are yet, then this video is definitely for you. So in the last video, we created an addition function. And all it did was add two numbers together. Instead, let's go ahead and create a few different other functions. And this is really just for example purposes. These might not be practical in real life, but I just want to show you what they can and cannot do. Or rather, not what they cannot do, just what they are able to do. So remember, you always start with a function keyword. And that's a reserved word, so don't call your variables the word function because that's going to cause a little bit of uh, a pain in your life as a developer. So this function, let's just call it getName. And this one's not going to take any parameters at all. Now, if we look at our index.html, we have from a previous lesson, I'm just going to indent this, we have an input field called text field. I'm going to actually change that to name and name here is what the value value is going to be. Actually, I'm going to change. That. I don't want a name here. Let's use a real name, a totally real name, John Smith. And just so you can see what this page looks like, all we have is an input field called John Smith. That's the only thing that's visible. Going back to our JavaScript, let's go ahead and get this value. We want to get this name. So we create a new variable and we want this variable to be local to the function. So we use var name is equal to document dot query oops, query selector and we want to select it by its class name of name. Now, if you remember from a previous lesson, as soon as we select this element, we have access to this entire element. We have access to its inner HTML, which there is none because it's a self-closing tag. We have access to its value, its class, its type, any other properties and attributes that we can give to it. We have access to all of that now. But all we want is the name. So let's change this from name to name element because that's just the element, the HTML element. And let's get the name as name element dot value. So we know that name element is selecting the name element in here. And we're going to grab the value, which matches this property or this attribute. Cool. So now we have a name. What if we want to mutate that name? What if we want to modify it a little bit? What if we said the last name Smith is too common and it has to be something else. So if anytime the last name Smith shows up, we automatically replace it. Well, what we can do is we can create a new variable. We're just going to call it new name is equal to name dot replace Smith with Tallinn. And to run this function, we just run get name. If I refresh this page, absolutely nothing's going to happen. I open up my console and nothing has happened. Now, why is that? Because this function is not returning anything. If we said alert new name, it's going to run this function. It's not going to run this stuff. It recognizes that it's there, but it's not going to run the code until here. So I'm going to go ahead, save that, refresh the page, and I get John Tallinn, whoever that might be. 
but we don't want alert the name. Nobody uses alerts anymore. So what we want to do is we want to return new name. And instead of just running this function, which it will still run, but we just don't have access to anything yet, we're going to create another variable called current name. And it's going to get the name from that input area, it's going to replace Smith with Tallinn, and it's going to give us whatever that name is. So now, if I said console.log current name, refresh the page, I get the current name. That's the name that's in here. So if I went into my index page, change that from John to Caleb, refresh, I now have Caleb Tallinn. That's because it's grabbing this value and it's changing Smith to Tallinn. But what if we wanted to do more? What if we just wanted to get the first name? We can create another function called get first name. And we want to get the entire name first. So we don't need to copy all of this over. We could, but that breaks the principle of don't repeat yourself. Your code should always stay dry. And dry is don't repeat yourself. In case you didn't catch that. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is variable name is equal to get name. This name does not conflict with this name at all because they're in different functions. This, this variable here is completely unaware that anything in here exists. And now we can use the same names over and over again in different functions. And while name ambiguity is sometimes a very difficult thing to work with because some names are just naturally ambiguous, it allows us to use na uh, variables like name, a common variable name, over and over again. Now, that's great. We have the name. What happens if we run alert name? I'm going to I'm going to comment those out and run get first name. Save, refresh, and I get the proper name again. Even though the input is Caleb Smith, it turned out to be Caleb Tallinn. And that's because it is now running a function inside of a function. Now that's pretty cool. But we only want the first name. So how do we break a string apart into different bits and pieces? Well, we can use split, which will essentially, if we tell it to, break the word based on all the spaces in the string. So variable first name is equal to name dot split and that's all we're going to do now instead of alerting that this is going to show up better if I console log this save refresh and this is an array we can tell because the proto is an array and there are two pieces to it Caleb and Tallinn but we only want the first name now we know with the array data type which we learned quite a while ago that the first one always starts with the index number zero. So what I can do is return first name zero, and that's the first name. Now, again, because I'm returning it, we're not actually getting any information that can be useful. It's being returned, great, but we're not able to access it yet. So again, we create another variable. and. Do not be afraid to use variables. Variables take up very little memory. It's not a problem. Use as many variables as you need. And we're going to say variable first name is equal to get first name. Get first name is going to run get name, whatever that returns. So this name is now the new name. We're going to take that name and we're going to split it. We're going to throw it into a variable called first name and we're going to only ever return the first part of that name. So this seems like a lot, and really, it, it's just one step at a time. That's all it is. So save, refresh, nothing happens. And that's because it's in this variable. But we haven't done anything with this variable yet. So let's console log first name, save, refresh. There we go, first name. What happens if I change this to anything else? Save, refresh. It gives us anything else. What happens if we have a lot of different words in here? It's a crazy middle name. Anything else, a lot of different words in here, Smith. 
That's the name that's currently in there. And it's still only returning that first word. So now you can see that functions are actually quite valuable because it allows us to write this code very easily. And we don't have to write it over and over again. So to summarize how a function works, or how our functions are currently working, is we have a variable. We declared it as first name is equal to get first name function. And that's going to be the value of whatever is returned. So we have step one is going to look for step two. But in actually step two would technically be here. Now, while step two is running, it's going to try to get this one. So this is step 2.1. And let's marry that up 2.1. And it's going to return whatever is in here. So 2.2. Now this changes to 2.2 because the name is whatever is returned in here. It's going to execute all this code for you. It's going to return what's in here, throw it into this variable called name. We split it, we return the first value. And now we have two functions that are operating together. And we don't ever have to write this code ever again. Now, if we really wanted to customize this based on any type of input field, we could add a parameter to get name called really anything you want to. But here we're just going to call it class selector. And your parameter name should always be clear. Give them nice clear names. Even if they're a little bit longer, clearer is better. And in here, we're going to simply add class selector. But now if we run this, it doesn't work. Why? Because get name is looking for the class selector parameter it doesn't exist. So we add the string in here, which essentially, we just moved it from here to here. That's all we did. If I save this, refresh the page, it still works. But if I select a class that has nothing in it, what's going to happen? Cannot read property value of null. So essentially what it's saying is the query selector that's selecting the name does not exist class somewhere on our page, which obviously is not anywhere in here, returned an empty HTML element. There's nothing in there. So it couldn't perform what it needed to perform. So just be careful with that. So that's essentially how functions can work. If you're still not completely clear on functions, uh, don't get too hung up on them. Uh, they are a little bit different to think about. It's a different way of thinking. Um, but over time, you'll get more used to them. And one of these days, or, or maybe in just a few minutes, your brain's going to click and it's going to go, oh, I know exactly how these work. But just keep at it. It's one of these things that doesn't make sense because we don't really use this uh, in normal human behavior. But as soon as you turn that logical part of your brain on, it gets a lot easier. So that wraps up this lesson. I hope this makes a lot more sense to you. Uh, I know we're sort of rushing through functions a little bit. That's mostly because functions are so common. Um, there's no way around them. And so as a programmer, as a web developer, you're going to become very, very familiar with these, whether you like it or not. Uh, and it's a very good thing. It's a very good thing to be aware of uh, how functions work. So that wraps up this lesson. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a few comments to this file uh, and you can download this file as well and, and test it out. I'm going to clean it up um, and make sure that, you know, it's a little easier to understand for, for you when you're actually reading through this code. Hello again, uh, it's me, Caleb, your instructor. You've made it through most of this course, um, if not all of it by now. And there's a good chance that Udemy is going to prompt you either soon or has recently prompted you and just wanted to ask you for your feedback. Uh, they just want to see how you're going to review this course. And so this video, what I'm making right now, is just a little message to say, please leave a review. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what you're feeling. Tell other people why you like this course. It's really important that we get the word out there. And the best way to do that, especially on a platform like Udemy, is to simply share your review. So if you haven't, please, please share your reviews uh, with everybody else. It would be 